Okay, I'm going to let everybody in. Oh, wow. <laughs> that happened fast. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we have 46 people, I think. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Lovely to see so many people. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Just had a few technical issues, which we hopefully have sorted out now. So we can start uh, pretty soon. Yeah, we are about 50 uh, colleagues here in the room, which is quite impressive. So um, yeah, I think we can slowly make a start. Yeah, as Rosie already said, yeah, welcome to our Popular Music Studies Research Day here at Huddersfield, uh, which is um, held in collaboration with IASPEN. Uh, and it's actually the third of this kind. The first one was a symposium uh, in 2017 on practice-based research. And some of you might have been here in 2018 for the Crosstown Traf Traffic IASPEN conference. And this, we had a bit of a gap, but now we are back with our third event. Hopefully this will also be uh, very interesting and stimulating. And um, what was a bit hidden in our announcement was, this is actually partly a symposium and partly part of our uh, postgraduate research seminar series. So um, uh, we have invited um, colleagues, but also students. So we have a broad and diverse um, uh, group of people here from early career researchers to senior researchers. And um, the idea of this um, symposium is that it will be some form of interaction or it should have an interactive format. So. Um, uh, we very much encourage you to, yeah, to take part in the contributions and the um, presenters are aware of this and they they will hopefully, um, yeah, st uh, facilitate uh, some discussions here. Um, yeah, the organizers of this event are Rosie Hill. Uh, I'm sure most of you know Rosie, who is the director of the um, Popular Music Studies Research Group and me, who is the director of the uh, Research Center for Music, Culture and Identity. And um, I will take this opportunity to thank IASPM for the collaboration and also the subject area of music and music technology who um, have funded this event. And of course, everybody who is here and joining us. Uh, and of course, all our three presenters. Um, yeah, the video is being recorded at the moment and we will upload this on YouTube. Uh, I hope everybody is okay with this. Um, and yeah, we are about to start. The program is, as announced, the same order. We start with Lena Dawes, who is talking about Afro-pessimism versus Afro-futurism in popular music. Then we will have Steve Waxman, who will talk about rock, rack, rap and race in the US concert industry. And then Paula <laughs> Wolf, songwriting, music production and self-production. And um, we will have 15 minutes of break in between and a final discussion to wrap everything up and maybe discuss any overarching themes. Um, I think that's about it, what I wanted to say. Uh, we're about to start uh, and I will hand over to Rosie who is chairing the first presentation. Hi everybody, it is, as Jan said, it's absolutely fantastic to see so many people here and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Lena Dawes to you. Lena is a doctoral scholar in ethnomusicology at Columbia University in New York. And she's the author of the hugely influential book, What Are You Doing Here? A Black Woman's Life and Liberation in Heavy Metal. Her recent publications include contributions to Fade to Grey, Androgyny, Art and Style in 80s Dance Music, and Metallica FAQ, All That's Left to Know About the Greatest Metal Band of All Time. She runs Women Clap Back in the Alternative Arts, which produces speaking events and panels for women of colour involved in New York's alternative art and music industries. And she's also a renowned music journalist. So welcome, Lena. Hi, welcome. Uh, good morning for us Eastern folk and good afternoon for the UK folk. Um, first, uh, before I start today, I just want to apologize. I am deathly ill. Uh, so I'm going to try and get through this today. 
um, muddle through it as best as I can. Um, but there was also a couple of other things I wanted to mention very quickly. Um, from uh, providing my abstract, which was a couple of months ago, I have made a few differences, few changes to my presentation. Um, in terms of just in terms of focusing on popular music culture, what I actually was uh, thinking of doing a couple of months ago was doing more kind of electronic dance uh, music. And then I decided that as this is part of my dissertation, which I'm currently working on, um, I did want to focus more on uh, heavy metal. So um, again, this is a work in progress, so please forgive me. Um, and generally about my research is I am interested in how black metal, uh, har black metal, hardcore and punk fans are able to maintain and cultivate their racial identity through their participation in white centric music cultures. Um, so what I thought I would do today is uh, start off with a red herring a little bit, which is um, while my presentation folk uh, questions, uh, whether Afrofuturism and Afro-pessimism serve as a theoretical entry point into exploring how racial identity factors into music listening, uh, preferences and performances um, within uh, extreme music cultures, uh, my particular interest is the removal of racial essentialism by arguing that the traditional modes within extreme music culture provide both physical and emotional spaces for black uh, metal, hardcore and punk fans to assert their individuality outside of common racialized tropes found in more mainstream popular uh, music cultures. So um, if uh, Rosemary, if you could go to the first slide where I've got a slide of just definitions. Uh, one thing that I've noticed in terms of um, doing this work is uh, um, I, you know, when we're sitting at home kind of working on our papers or whatnot, and I'm throwing in all these catchphrases, especially as a metal fan. And there's always an assumption on my end that everybody who's into metal knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so for today's presentation, I thought I'd better start off with a list of definitions. Um, so the uh, first one is uh, when I use extreme music in this presentation. So what I mean by extre extreme music is kind of non mainstream uh, popular music uh, forms. So I'm talking primarily about death, black, thrash, uh, 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 death, black, thrash, grindcore, hardcore and punk genres is where my research focus is on. So when I say extreme music in this presentation, that's what I mean. So kind of underground music scenes, um, heavy metal that's more aggressive, uh, primarily not the mainstream stuff like Metallica or Iron Maiden and whatnot. Um, so a lot of my research is focused on that. Um, when I say black centric, I'm really talking about kind of music and culture that originates from black communities. Um, so these are kind of localized or national um, kind of communities of black people. Um, so in terms of talking about music and black centric music genres, I will say R&B, hip hop, uh, blues, jazz, swing in this, dem um, in this presentation. When I say white centric, um, I mean um, basically, uh, again, music or culture that is thought to come out of primarily white male um, patriarchal capitalist um, societies. So when we talk about, you know, the, the history of heavy metal, it's usually based on, and the scholarship is based on black, or sorry, white, men's experiences primarily. Um, in terms of racial essential, essentialism, which I mentioned a couple of times in this presentation, I'm talking about aesthetics, trends, and fashions in terms of how we essentialize people based on not only their ethnicity, but also kind of the trends and the um, consumerist trends that go along with this. So in hip hop, for instance, gold chains. Um, for R&B, you might have a beautiful singer that looks like um, uh, Mary J. Blige. So it's kind of like the fashions and the trends that go along with the genres of music that I'll be uh, briefly discussing today. Um, a bit later in the discussion, um, I will be actually throwing in, and this is my red herring, um, Black Sabbath, which really has nothing to do with this presentation, but I want to talk about it anyway. Um, so before we get to uh, Black Sabbath, which I'll talk about near the end of the presentation, I kind of wanted to tell you a little story that happened to me 
in 2019. And this kind of inspired me to think about Afro, um, both Afrofuturism and Afro-pessimism in terms of the, cultivati the cultivization of one's Black identity within these uh, music scenes. So in the fall of 2019, I traveled to Birmingham, England to attend a special gallery exhibition dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the formation of Black Sabbath, the most prominent heavy metal band in the genre's history. Birmingham is an important historical landmark in England's music scene, as it was the first English city to create and sustain its own musical community of experimental artists. From the 1950s, a social network of clubs, pubs, and other live venues and record shops created a collective of blues, jazz, rock, indie, punk, post-punk, and heavy metal artists. The city's music community gained a reputation in welcoming experimental music artists and supporting them by offering venues and other spaces that promoted musical diversity. So Home of Metal is a Birmingham-based nonprofit organization that was founded by musicians and, uh, and independent, uh, independent academic, uh, sorry, academic and independent music scholars um, they hosted a symposium the day after I got to Birmingham in 2019. Um, and they had a workshop that coincided with the closing of the ex exhibition. During the Q&A portion for a late afternoon panel, I posed the question to an American musicologist who presented on how blues and Latin jazz music influenced Black Sabbath's early albums. I asked the professor, putting aside the fact that his presentation slides also included a race, racist quote about Mexicans from Black Sabbath vocalist Ozzy Osbourne, who hated the incorporation of Latin jazz, to which the audience laughed. If the band's principal songwriter, guitarist Tony Iommi, felt any personal affinity with the African-American blues musicians that inspired him. As the members of Black Sabbath were raised in an era when Birmingham was considered a socially and economically disenfranchised industrial town, but one in which a number of American blues, jazz, and swing bands toured, I was interested in the presenter's observations surrounding musical and or the spiritual connection with rural and poor Black musicians that wrote about living in the, the then segregated South. From previous interviews I'd read, I knew the answer, which was that Iomi was heavily inspired, and the exhibition itself paid homage to a few Black blues greats. But I was wondering why the presenter never mentioned racial or cultural diversity from an individualized view in this paper, as it was a crucial component to how the band decided to create their unique blend of music. The response was surprising. The presenter hesitated a bit too long in answering my question. So another panelist on stage asked if I could repeat the question, even though I was pretty sure she heard it the first time. I did and elaborate a bit more, thinking that perhaps I hadn't made my question clear. She paused for a second and then said, oh, is this about racism? Everybody thinks everything is racist these days. The other panelists then tried to white explain the issue for me while accusing me of derailing the conversation. Taken aback, I responded that I wasn't suggesting that. The panelists, the female panelists continued, seemingly angry at my question, but still refusing to directly address it. She added if there were, quote, lots of black guitarists, such as Jimi Hendrix. And then she asked me, did I know about Jimi Hendrix? I explained myself again and added that the co-optation of blues musical influences among traditional hard rock and heavy metal music is commonplace, yet rarely mentioned. She angrily responded that, that even talking about this issue was racist and perhaps white guitarist Eric Clapton influenced Black Sabbath instead of African-American uh, blues musicians. This example represents a growing resistance in noting how race and black centric music is reflected within a predominantly white and male music culture. As a Canadian and as someone who has lived in America for almost eight years, it was also a reminder that because of the American history of, trans of the transatlantic slave trade, pointed discussions about race and music are more complicated to have in countries who have different views on multiculturalism and diversity. So first, is heavy metal even considered a genre that is included in what we deem as popular music. In order to determine this, we have to look at what is considered as popular. 
The definition adjusts depending on the generation and how technology has affected how music is made and the talents of the artists uh, and what the public deems as popular music. And most importantly, how artists uh, are received by the mainstream music industry who agree to sign them and distribute their music both nationally and internationally. Is their music sellable to a general and diverse audience? Are they easily marketable by fitting into the trends within the generations they're making music in? According to Robert Walzer, heavy metal's popularity grew in North America in the 1980s as pop-friendly subgenres such as hair and glam metal sold the most records under the rock and roll category. However, in the decade prior, British and European bands toured extensively and the most popular bands such as Black Sabbath, Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin were signed to major record labels and their music charted in the UK and North America. In the 1990s, record labels were clamoring to benefit from the popularity of hair and glam metal bands and Metallica, Van Halen um, and former Black Sabbath singer at that time, Ozzy Osbourne and later Slayer were all signed to major label major labels and offer global distribution and touring opportunities and, and merchandising deals. While considered popular because of radio play, extensive touring, and of course, hit singles, heavy metal has now branched out from mainstream popular culture to also having a robust local and national extreme music culture scene, which allows a more culturally, sexually, and racially diverse fan base. There are more black punk, metal, and hardcore bands than ever before, as marginalized artists can avoid the racial limitations stemming from the problems of music categorization and the penchant for music to be seen as a marker of one's racial, culture, and political identity. Because of this, this presentation will look at three ways of looking at race and representation and metal music through the lens, through the lens of theoretical frameworks created to explore the positionality of Black creatives within this contemporary scene. Okay, so um, the next slide should be Afrofuturism. Uh. Lena, I just uh, need to apologize that the um, revised slides that you sent didn't come through correctly. So I'm using the slides that you sent through yesterday. So just okay. to bear that in mind, apologies for that. So this is our next slide. Is that the right one or do I need to move on further? Um, you need to move on. I'm gonna play this actually later. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, so Afrofuturism. So if you see on the left side, I just saw this meme on the weekend. I thought it was funny, so I put it in. Um, but this is actually representative of some of the issues we are dealing with in terms of uh, talking about kind of um, contemporary issues of music. Who are the music listeners? And there still is this emphasis placed on hip hop is only for black people. And then I have black music on the side, which is a picture of uh, Gaul. I no, it's not Gaul. I can't remember who it is, but anyway, black music, black music, musician, uh, black music in terms of hip hop, that is not really funny, but it's something that happens. Okay, so I'm gonna go into Afrofuturism. Um, so in the groundbreaking essay, Black to the Future, Mark Derry begins his introduction to the philosophy of Afrofuturism, speculating on why there is a dearth of African-American coined speculative fiction at the time of uh, his writing in the mid 19th, mid 90s. Um, after all, he writes, designs on the future offer an escape from contemporary paternalism, boundaries and oppressions, and most importantly, an opportunity for black communities to operate outside of the present day liminal racialized spaces. Derry coins the term Afrofuturism to argue that African American art and literature that appropriates images and sounds of technology encourages future possibilities that center on black creativity and a narrative to possibilities outside of contemporary black life. So contemporary music, such as the technological hybrid, hybridization of R&B and hip hop that employs futuristic soundscapes and a variance of different production innovations are often thought to represent musical advancements that will stay static in popular culture. The early days of sampling music were brought on to disrupt the artifacts of technology and entertainment media. Quote, beeper culture, end quote, which is the introduction of technology in the early 1980s, such as sampling the sounds of Nintendo games, cell phones, and using artificial sounding samplers and drum machines are also early indicators of black people creating music outside the traditional nodes 
modes of what Black music was. In the 1990s and the 2000s, futuristic sounds and visuals within hip hop were uh, the trademark of popular uh, producer uh, Timberland's work with Missy Elliott and Justin Timberlake and Pharrell Williams, who with his group Nerd and his production work under the monkeyer the Neptunes, reinvigorated tra traditional R&B and hip hop in the early 2000s. UK hip hop subgenres like grime, jungle, and drill also reflect Black creativity and a window into what Black Britons imagine in their futures. Okay. Um, whoops. Prior to the boom of producers who became just as, if not more, popular than the artists they collaborated with, manipulating current technology to create unique and futuristic sounds was commonplace in inner city African American. Afro-Caribbean and Latino neighborhoods that in comparison to other boroughs were often financially and socially disparate, partly because of financial costs and lack of access to researching the latest technological devices, electronic components from record turntables, portable radios, stereo speakers, sound systems, Walkmans and later disc players were manipulated to create unique sounds often used as foundational samples to layer underneath vocals or rhyming. In terms of the music, early Afrofuturistic innovators that musically imagined a futuristic freedom and the cultiva cultivation of a self-cultivated Black identity included Sun Ra, Alice Coltrane, George Clinton, Jill Scott Heron, Miles Davis, and even, African, and even the African funk of Fela Kuti that pushed Black music into a futuristic dimension. One of the most interesting artists that challenged the often monolithic notions of black music was Screaming Jay Hawkins, the first shock rock artist in popular culture. After a suggestion by famed disc jockey, Alan Freed, this video, which I'm gonna show you in just in a second, is from the 1956 performance on his show that he used, uh, he, you're gonna see that he uses stage props when performing his it's single for a televised segment um, and Hawkins often appeared in, in public wearing voodoo inspired top hats and using stage props such as skull heads, bones, smoke, and a coffin. Um, so Rosemary, if you could switch, uh, go to the slide. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is Screaming Jay Hawkins and hopefully my embedded video here will work. Hold on, let me see if I can get the um, You might need up. to click on enable content. There's a security ah, warning. Thank you, Jan. Let's try again. Yes. Okay, so um, we'll just play maybe like 10, 10, 15 seconds of this. And um, yeah, Rosemary, I don't, if you could, um, yeah, put up the volume a little bit. Can you, can you hear it, Lena? Barely. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what, let's move on because we have other music samples too. So um, this is fine. But um, just to kind of continue on with uh, Screaming Jay Hawkins and why He's kind of important in this discussion is that he took blues music and lyrics to introduce a new narrative for African Americans, an individual who stepped outside of black respectability politics to create an image of someone who, like previous blues innovators, forced society to see a different aspect of black life. This, I argue, is one that mirrored quote unquote white life and its messiness. Love, sexuality, depression were displayed as universal human traits that bridge the two divides. But through his costuming, staging, and his vocal delivery, Hawkins introduced the religious iconography of the African Caribbean derived religion and parodied the viewer's fear of the occult while simultaneously demonstrating, perhaps unwittingly, 
that the religion is part of the African American diaspora. While never commercially successful, he became the inspiration for artists like Alice Cooper and later other hard rock and metal artists to use theatrical aesthetics derived from the supernatural to brand themselves as being just as ghoulish as the music they created. Hawkins' bravery to push against the unwritten codes within black communities was daring and provocative, but he offered an aesthetic that employed both the past and the future. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna go on and give a very brief description of Afro-pessimism. And please note that actually part of this work or part of this presentation and exercise is really about taking um, scholarship that doesn't necessarily talk about music and injecting music into the conversation. So um, for Afro-pessimism, I kind of focused on two texts in order to try and make them more of a, a reflective of like heavy metal, hardcore and punk. And like, so we can talk about these genres within this, these theories of Afrofuturism and Afro-pessimism. So um, I started off with Paul Gilroy's writings about black music and the politics of authenticity um, in which he centers on the idea that seeking black cultural integrity within a society which contains a pernicious metaphysical dualism that codes blacks by their bodies and whites by their intelligence. Black music is therefore full of meaning, such as social, cultural, and political legitimacy that serves as a foundation in which to define a specific brand of black folk cultural authenticity. This means that um, creating music and art separate from the art and the cultural practices created within the dominant Eurocentric culture is seen as a political black nationalist act. In contemporary discussions about black music, Gilroy is concerned with the usage of black music as a cultural continuity of black traditions and popular music, but he admits that this can be essentializing as the cultural authenticity of diasporic black musical genres and specific kinds of music that symbolize a radical political change tends to be ignored. I believe that Afrofuturistic musical practices center on music making within colonized nations where the contemporary music industry model determines who to market uh, uh, to based on the current pop culture trends and the political and economic conditions. The term black music is not just a descriptor of the originators of a sound and style, but as Gilroy suggests is often used as a guide in shaping and maintaining a black identity. The problem is that there are parameters within the cultivization of that identity that suggests that Afrofuturism can only exist if one listens and or performs black music within a liminal space. Despite the internet offering a myriad of digital spaces where people can discover a variance of musical styles outside, uh, styles outside of black music, the legacy of the transatlantic uh, African enslavement and consequently the need for communal practices to cultivate black identity clash with notions of listening and performing non-black originated music genres, such as heavy metal, hardcore and punk. All genres that on the surface run counter to the cultivization of racial identity and pride. For Frank Wilderson, who wrote on the performative limits of Afrofuturism, a shared sense of violence and captivity through the legacy of enslavement provides performative limitations that hinder musical freedom and independent artistry. Those who want to be known by their artistic talents have to endure the understanding that being marked as black means that the damage in pursuing it means a quote, compromised existential status, unquote. It is a narrative strategy hoping to slip the news of a life shaped and compromised by slavery, unquote. Wilderson argues that one must fight to avoid the ghosts of the legacy of slavery and captivity and suggests that these ghosts are static within the black North American life. So the difference between Afrofuturism and Afropessimism within music is measured by how the artist wants to impact their lived environment or I should say maybe um, display their lived environment and how they see their place in it. Wilderson suggests that there are two ways of meaning that artists use to differentiate themselves within. First, he argues that, that it is the context of how artists, not the content within their demand for visibility that is important. Context refers to how black artists lived a quote unquote blackened 
life, unquote, that exists, that exists within a structurally violent world that has historically included, excluded Black people and ignored Black contributions in favor of what he calls the, quote, niggerization, unquote, of the lens, meaning how Blacks are often viewed. The difference here is between asserting one's individuality as part of the African diaspora, thereby, thereby adopting a sense of belonging and being purposeful in the form, formulations of racial, political, social, and cultural ideas, and the belief that one is part of the nation state that is created on white westernized political, cultural, and social constructs and asserting one's place in it. So I'm actually going to uh, skip over a little bit um, and uh, I actually want to show you a video. Um, Rosemary, it should be the uh, uh, early graves slide. Okay, so um, here's an example of what I believe represents Afro pessimism within extreme music. House nigger, excuse my language, um, is a track from the Early Graves 2008 debut album, We the Guillotine. The singer Mac Daniels was an African-American and Pacific Islander American. He passed away in 2010, right before the metalcore band's second album was released. On this track, he describes his experiences being a black man on tour with his band. The lyrics are shaped around the sheer anger he felt and accompanied with a metalcore sound. So the viciousness is palatable. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, in listening to a snippet of that track, how do we locate elements of Afro pessimism within popular music? As I research black participation within white centric music genres, such as heavy metal, hardcore and punk, the notion that Afro pessimism diff offers, such as the impetus to live a fully individualized life outside of the white gaze is best represented within underground music scenes. Sonic disembodiment and aggressive rhythm serve as a foundation to add comparable lyrics centered on shared experiences of the human condition that belie race, sexuality, and gender. Similar to the early hip hop lyricism that was grounded in the narration um, of the often challenging aspects of black life within a capitalist, consumerist, and racist society, the matching of nihilistic music that celebrates the intensity and power of life in which heavy metal, as theorist Eidelberger Avalar posits, is actually more critical of nihilism than other forms of popular music. Pop pointed lyrics about the underbelly of the human condition paint a more realistic version about the human condition. So as we saw there with this track, um, and really the lyrics here are what got me when I first listened to this song, when I talk about like Afro pessimism and nihilism, I liked, I thought of this sample to play because I felt that Mac Daniels was actually using or matching the anger and the frustration of being a black man in America with music that accur accurately reflects that emotion. So he's using his band, he's using metalcore um, sounds in order to accentuate the meaning of the song. And interestingly enough, when I was doing research on this, on this particular song, which never, uh, never hit as a single, but what was interesting is that really nobody talked, there's only one journalist that talked to Mac Daniels before he died about this song and why he wrote the song. And that person also happened to be black. So even though this was an important song in terms of a lead singer and a metal band talking about his racialized experiences, and kind of using nihilistic elements of Afro pessimism in order to formulate how the lyrics match the music. Um, this song, when it came out in 2008, really fell under the radar. And that kind of goes back to 
a larger discussion about the heavy metal scene in particular and dealing with race and difference, um, especially within our current social and political climate. So this song also represents um, another mode of Afro-pessimism through the vocal styling, which is an opportunity to explore the various, various discourses on race. In this track, Daniels employs nihilistic elements within the lyrical content by centering himself in the now versus the future and employs serrated, age, uh, serrated edges that accentuate the urgency in his voice and aptly reflects the anger and hurt in experiencing racism as a physical outsider, but a musical insider within the metal scene. In Jennifer Lynn Stover's article on racializing sound, her concept, which is the, uh, the sonic color line, describes the process that goes into racializing sound and discusses how bodies are expected to omit and produce these sounds, as well as how these sounds create a hierarchical division between whiteness and blackness. Similar to Hortense Spiller's 1987's theory of the hieroglyphics of the flesh, in which she posits that invisible markings of the racialized body disrupt the divisions between property, gender, violence, and sexuality, Stover looks at how these symbols, in this case, omitted through sound, are created to give meaning to a body and what that body represents within society. Stover asserts that the sonic color line is driven by the listening ear, which provides interpretation and surveillance. The power of music that encourages a disembodied voice allows for freedom for the individualized expression through music. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to Black Sabbath. We'll try and figure out how this is gonna work. So um, yeah, Rosemary, if you could go back to the, uh, yeah, the Black Sabbath. Uh, so everyone, I want you to um, just listen to maybe the first, uh, we'll do 30 seconds of um, uh, the track. I want you to kind of listen to the blues elements um, in this track. And hopefully you're, you're gonna see what I'm trying to get at in my future work um, in relation to um, kind of like what music fits into Afrofuturism and what music fits into Afro-pessimism. And can we even look at white bands in relation to um, putting them into these categories? So um, yeah, Rosemary, if you could play the first like 30 seconds. Okay, so basic, I just wanted um, to uh, play obviously the introduction. So you can actually hear in terms of, uh, this was from the first uh, Black Sabbath album in 1970. Um, and I was really interested in like the harmonica, like that rhythm section that kicks in. And like, even though it's very dated in the sound um, as of right now, because um, even though there's a lot of blues and swing and, and groove elements within the, that introduction, um, it's also a very 70s sound, so it's coming from a localized space. Um, so, you know, I've always wondered why, despite clearly listening, hearing African and Latin American musical influences in the early albums of the band, why there is no scholarship on Black, Black Sabbath fandom or lack thereof. As a musical signifier, such as the boogie woogie bass, swing drums, delta blues modulations, and of course the riffs are familiar musical elements. Um, and this assertion can be also directed towards other bands that emerged in the late 1960s, such as Led Zeppelin, Blue Cheer, and Deep Purple. Um, I'm going to add Coven in there too. Um, all, um, all that are more blues rock than heavy metal, and all that have uh, been accused of cultural co-optation. On the other hand, in Steve Wakesman's writing about how Jimi Hendrix was initially received by both Black and white audiences, he writes that some um, were deterred uh, because playing hard electric guitar driven rock 
was distinctively different from the black avant-garde and jazz that within the post-civil rights era represented a black nationalist mode of expression. In addition, noise distortions were indescribable and unpalatable to virgin ears and many considered them an affront to black respectability politics. Politics that in some situations determine whether one lived or died. Consequently, contemporary African-American metal guitars face the same issue. Do we play for the love of the music or we, do we play to represent the race in a positive light? What are the limits to the latter? So in researching for this presentation, I came across Trace Riddell's theory of outside Afrofuturism. Riddell posits that there is a number of white rock, electronic and avant-garde artists who because of their whiteness are effectively shut out of the Afrofuturistic label despite creating similar music with a similar aesthetic. Outside Afrofuturism, he writes, opens up alternative routes towards understanding subjectivity and culture through speculative social sonic practices in particular, while maintaining social behaviors that reject multiculturalism's artificial paternal origins, boundaries, and lineages. So this is both a response to accusations of cultural co-optation and an introduction to thinking how technological hybrid hybridization leads to effortless ethnoforgery through subject identity. Those who can emotionally or sonically relate to, to the origins of musical sound are the ones who can adapt it. Riddell argues that this differs from Afrofuturism, which is contingent on history versus creating interpretations based on multi multimodalities of subjectivity. Therefore, outside Afrofuturism is the way in which the strategies of appropriation and montage push identity formations from national and racial into technological and cultural frames. So the next st step of my research is to ask, does Black Sabbath fall into the definition of outside Afrofuturism through their foundational usage of blues, swing, and grooves? Currently, I believe they do. In addition, outside Afrofuturism can also be uh, an accurate descriptor for Black musicians who use elements of metal, punk, and hardcore within their musicality, using foundational elements to create their own unique sound. So um, that is kind of where I am at in terms of my research. So the next step is to kind of look more at outsider Afrofuturism um, to see whether we can kind of include some of these traditional heavy metal bands into Afrofuturism. And also if we do this, maybe this will bridge the divide in terms of um, certain reluctances from black communities into looking at heavy metal as a legitimate uh, music or even a legitimate popular music culture, which will allow more black and brown bodies um, within these spaces. So thank you for my time. I know that was running a little long, but um, thank you for being patient with me today. Thank you so much, Lena. It's absolutely fascinating. And I've made copious notes and apologies for my mistakes with the screen sharing. It's absolutely really no just riveting. And the questions that you raise are just so exciting to, to ponder. I wonder if we have any questions from our participants. Do not to either raise your hand or write in the chat if you have any questions or comments for Lena. Ah, yes, we have a question from Rupert. Do you want to introduce yourself, Rupert? Yeah, I'm Rupert Till. I'm a professor of music here at the University of Huddersfield, and I'm also chair of the International Association of the Study of Pop Music. Um, I, I totally agree with, um, with most of your premise, most of your analysis. I think um, it's really interesting to look at uh, black music within metal uh, and very valid to do so. Um, I'm not sure I would agree with you that there hasn't been any any academic work describing acts like Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin um, as having um, co-opted without proper accreditation uh, black music. Having written a chapter specifically on that subject, um, I mean, I, I I think there is work, but I think in in older popular music studies, I think there was quite a lot of study that suggested that the whole history of popular music in the Anglo-American context is, is pretty much about the taking of black music sources by 
white musicians um, and that that is really well understood, whether it's the Beatles, uh, the Beach Boys, Elvis Presley, um, the Rolling Stones, um, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Eminem, Glenn Miller, whoever. I mean, it's just a constant history. And maybe that's been taken a bit for granted in more research, recent scholarship. And so it hasn't really achieved much, um, much description. I, my question to you, so I've witted on for a bit, my question for you really is, in the UK charts at the moment, more than half of the acts in the top 10 are, are black. So black music is now the majority, the mainstream of popular music. Do you think that starts to change any of these discussions and descriptions? Does it, uh, does it change your perspective on things, do you think? Um, yeah, well, first of all, I didn't quite mean that there was no uh, readings based on cultural co-optation of Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. With Led Zeppelin, there obviously is has been a lot of writing and research about um, the co-optation of Black music and actually the uh, fact that um, there was some, I think, uh, issues surrounding even the writing uh, permissions and who actually wrote the music for Led Zeppelin. Um, what I was trying to say was that um, in terms of Black fandom and the Black um, experience listening to Black Sabbath because of the blues elements and even listening to Led Zeppelin or Deep Purple and kind of lo locating um, those elements of blues and rock within Black communities to see whether um, these elements, these musical elements are actually helping or hindering more Black participation within these genres. That's what I was trying to get at. Um, in terms of the... Um, lists of black music like um have like just because black music is on the charts does not mean there's not a problem within heavy metal hardcore and punk um there still is an issue in terms of black representation within these genres which are primarily um white centric uh white male dominated genres so um it doesn't really matter to people in terms of seeing black music has always been on the charts black music has always been popular what I'm trying to do right now is that look at kind of the underground musical scenes and wonder why there's no black, I shouldn't say there's no black representation, but there's li limited black representation and there's a lot of resistance in relation to people getting involved into the underground scenes, whether as fans, um, musicians or industry workers. So that's kind of where my focus is. Um, we know that black music and the enjoyment of black music does nothing for the racial divisions that exist within the larger uh, music industry. So that's kind of why I say that it's great that there's a lot of black people on the charts, but we're still missing um, black people and also marginalized people, people of color within these uh, specific genres that I'm focused on in my research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, Nick Knack, you have a question. Great to see you here, by the way. Hi, um, firstly, thank you for putting this on because I've been also writing furiously during during this. Um, uh, I guess my point is kind of um, carrying on from uh, the, 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 the last one. Um, so I'm, I'm an artist, I primarily work within electronic music and you mentioned like turntablism very briefly in your talk. Um, which was fantastic, by the way. Um, I wondered what um, your thoughts were um, in terms of like the, I guess the representation or, and, and or lack thereof um, within like the black electronic music kind of, kind of world and um, how that maybe contributes to um or or maybe challenges um your your research at this point because i do agree yes there is a lot of um black black music in the charts but the charts is its own world in itself and it's representative of certain types of black music um and there are other other genres i can speak more from an electronic point of view where there's other things going on and it's not getting the same kind of um, recognition or attention um, but I'm just one out of a, a, a sea of artists you know so I just wondered what your, um, your your thoughts were in terms of like the kind of electronic music side is it very similar to uh, kind of the, the the rock side of things or yeah um, 
Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I did a pre I did a, a presentation a couple of months ago and where I kind of talked about uh, black futures and I was actually focused more on black elect, um, um, black uh, artists like um, more mother. Um, yeah, uh, I love her and kind of the work that more mother was doing also dissolve uh, divide and dissolve from Australia. Um, and also obviously Zeal and Arter, who's more kind of industrial metal. So looking at some electronic artists like that in terms of um, talking about kind of um, black futurisms and creating sonic spaces um, that kind of represent um, kind of not only the acknowledgement of kind of the history of technology within black communities, like back to the DIY of the 19, late 1970s, 1980s American hip hop um, scene, you know, the sampling, the experimentation um, that was going on now and moving it into a contemporary thing. And so for um, more mother, the only thing I would say, I believe it's probably easier for black electronic artists versus black um, underground uh, extreme artists. Um, but what I do find interesting is that um, in thinking about more mother in particular, um, she still is able to have extremely pointed and political lyricism on top of her beats and within her production, which kind of pushes her music further and makes it more pointed in terms of, I wouldn't say it goes into the Afro pessimism route, but there's something about it that kind of pushes kind of the narrative in terms of blacks within this Afrofuturistic space. Um, Divide and Dissolve is primarily um, an instrumentalist group, but what they are doing is within these soundscapes, they are still also kind of pushing the envelope in terms of discussions about colonialism, um, climate change, environmental issues that are all encapsulated within these soundscapes that they create. Um, so I think that there's also a group called, um, a lovely woman from Montreal called Ashanti, who is, um, she go, she's producing under the uh, name uh, uh, Backwash. I think I have that right. Anyway, she is a really incredible electronic and she's doing the same thing. She's kind of mixing um, um, you know, technology, musical technologies and using kind of an industrialized uh, metal track. And she does rap on top of it too. So she's got the whole package of kind of really introducing something a little bit new into the soundscape. So those are th um, three or four. And then obviously Zillanarda has been doing it for a number, well, two. I'm not that familiar with electronic music but those were the artists that I kind of um, was researching a few months ago in terms of trying to figure out what artists are locating this kind of pushing the limits within that electronic dance genre. So I don't know that if I answer your question, <laughs> but that's kind of where I'm at in terms of looking at that space, but it's definitely harder um, for artists who are interested in um, getting into punk hardcore metal bands. And a lot of that has to do with anti-black racism. And it also has to do with the categorizations that the music industry has placed upon what music is marketed towards this person, what music is marketed towards that person. And that really causes a lot of issues in relation to how people are um, view, like, you know, even considering what music to listen to. Um, so I believe that because of that, and also kind of the history of heavy metal um, coming from predominantly white male working class spaces, um, it's still it's still resistant to kind of this this change that is reflecting more diverse uh, people within the scene. There are more black people, young black people involved in these genres. That's just a fact. But there's still resistance to kind of opening the doors for more to come in. Thank you. Um, I think we have one time for one last quick question from Hussein. If you want to introduce yourself, please. <laughs> Thank you is very it much. Is going to be quick? No, probably. I will try. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid my track record is actually not very good, Rosemary. So, uh, <laughs> okay. um, I very rarely ask questions. My name is Hussein Boon. I'm from uh, the University of Westminster and uh, at home. And um, 
Thank you very much, Lena. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of uh, reading a book, so uh, I'm really happy to sort of, uh, uh, to also see these two things kind of coincide together. In terms of Black Sabbath, because I've worked in notes, um, some of the things I think are, 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 are less obvious about Black Sabbath are like things like the use of things like uh, 12 string guitars, like when you hear it in Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, and those kinds of movements tend to be sort of also more sort of jazz oriented, kind of probably reflective of people like Bert Jansch and as a similar influence to, to someone like Jimmy Page. Right. Um, but then added to that is something like Changes, because Changes mm. is basically a soul gospel tune. When you hear it sort of sung by Charles Bradley, it suddenly becomes completely revealed um, to everyone. And I think that it's in those, in those lesser traveled kind of areas where, where in many ways these influences sort of come through um, as, as well. And, and, and that's, that's kind of an interesting place to kind of go to. Second one, I think, I, uh, and maybe Steve might say something about this, was really about Jimi Hendrix, because I see him also in that sci-fi Afrofuturist kind of role, especially when you think of things like Spanish uh, Castle Magic, and then you listen to the soundscapes on Electric Lady Land, like 1983 and various other things. Um, and then of course, into the kind of the protest stuff to do with uh, like Machine Gun and so on, you become uh, completely aware that he's using the guitar in a way that actually, <laughs> pretty much no one else was, was really using it at that time. And it can only really point to a, to a kind of a different headspace, even though it's come from the blues, it's very much uh, a differently derived one from what people like Clapton and so on uh, were doing in their sort of sedentary way of playing solos. Um, so I would sort of, I, I, would, I would say, I, I'd like to hear Hendrix in your, in your list along with Sun Ra and George Clinton. <laughs> because of that um but that that's kind of my uh, only real observation and the only other thing about spaces that um uh, nicole was talking about and and that you're talking about i really think that when, you know when when i look at magazines like diy magazine and you look at it in terms of its front covers you can only have a music style that kind of gets recognized and is on the map if you have access to the variety of kind of dissemination channels uh, mm -hmm. media channels and so on so when you look at something like DIY magazine, which you would think, whether it's extreme music or it's electronic music or anything else, it's being they are DIY phase kind of artists. They, they will not find a home in traditional record labels. And yet you look at the covers and, you know, for the last nearly 10 years, it's I think it's three covers with with non-white people on the front cover. You know, and if you're if you're if you're doing like twelve issues a year, front covers, churning them out, you get the impression that actually that is not your space. You don't really belong here. Therefore, well, just just to paraphrase your title, um, but you get the feeling that you don't really belong. So therefore, what are you doing here? This is nothing to do with you. So I, I, I would I, I would sort of feed back in that that there is it's not just the the absence in academic discourses to can to continue to refer back and say, look, this still, it carries on. Just because it was said 20 years ago, 30 years ago, hasn't changed a single thing because it still happened, right? Right, yeah, thank you. You know, thank you so much um, for your comment. And actually that's one thing that I um, have to do, like when I continue working on this paper is do another close reading of Jimi Hendrix. And I have obviously Steve's book but I realized last night that I'm like, oh, I should have done a more closer reading because yeah. I agree with you, but I just didn't have the language at the time to effectively push that in. But that is something that I need to do more work on is really yeah. look at also the guitar, like the musicianship and the history of what he was trying it does, to it, do. It, it, does, it does go to a different place. I didn't mean it as a, as a, as a criticism or anything else. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> No, it's your ball. You can do what you want with it, you know. But the, but I, I do think there's that influence of the sci-fi writers like uh, Ursula Le Guin and so on. You know, yeah. like the ship who sang. Like you can hear that whole thing of like if we travel by dragonfly and so on and so forth. You can see where that kind of imagery is uh, it's kind of coming from. Uh, and the, and that kind of predictive thing in the 1983 in terms of uh, nuclear war, which kind of sits within the general frame of of uh, issues around Gaia, the ecology, which then lines up with things like what's going on in terms of Marvin Gaye and so on. You see this kind of uh, black mus musical kind of focus within these sorts of areas that are not necessarily matched within the 
the white kind of centered areas, you know, they're, they're, right. they're, then they're kind of essentially following in the wake. They're not necessarily at the vanguard. So okay. that's all I have to say, I'm afraid. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, if, um, if, they, if you're happy, Lena, to um, have a break now and um, we'll come back at quarter past in about 10 minutes. Um, and we'll see what Steve's got to say and where he might build on this. I'm sure some of you might stay and carry on chatting in the space over the next 10 minutes. You're very welcome to do that. I'm going to pop to the loo. Um, but thank you so much, Lena, for an absolutely fascinating presentation. And that opens up really exciting new ways for me as a, a music listener and fan to uh, explore um, some of the music that I've loved for a long time, but to listen with new ears. So yes, a, a big round of applause for Lena. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rosemary and Jan, for organizing this today. It was great, thank you. Hi, wie geht's dir? Oh, alles okay?
Great to see you guys, by the way. Thank you so much for hosting this. It's been awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. You too. Yeah, maybe we make a start. I hope your break was long enough to get a, a coffee and stretch your legs. Very good. Um, yeah, uh, our next presentation links quite well um, to the previous presentation, actually better than I anticipated. Um, yeah, and it's my pleasure to introduce you, although he doesn't require introduction, I believe, uh, to Steve Waxman, <laughs> who is a professor of American Studies and Music at Smith College in Northampton in Massachusetts. And some of his work was already quoted earlier on, but just to remind you and give a summary, uh, he's of course the author of Instruments of Desire, The Electric Guitar and the Shaping of, of the Musical Experience, but also of This Ain't the Summer of Love, Conflict and Crossover in Heavy Metal and Punk. And he has recently co-edited uh, The Sage Handbook of Popular Music, and I think what is most relevant, um, he has got a book going to be published uh, with Oxford University Press on the US um, live music industry, which also forms the basis for today's talk, which is titled Rock, Rap and Race in the US Concert Industry. With this, I pass over to you, Steve. Thank you, Jan. And uh, thanks to you and Rosie for organizing this. Uh, it's really lovely to be here virtually, of course, and to be sharing the virtual stage with Lena and Paula. Um, so uh, yeah, let me just share my screen and, and we will get into it. Uh, okay. 
I have the share sound on, I believe. So <laughs> hopefully that'll work when uh, we get there. Okay, everybody see my screen okay? Yes, cool. Um, so I'm gonna start with a few slides that just provide some data and then um, we'll kind of use that to lead into the talk. Um, can people actually see what's on this slide? Like, can you actually read it? Okay, great. I will still give a little summary, but if you can look at it a little bit yourself, that would be great too. So this is the list of top grossing tours of 1987 from Polestar Magazine. Polestar is, since the early 80s, the leading magazine that covers the US live music industry. It's sort of like the live music equivalent to Billboard. Uh, and this allows us to see like, okay, so who were the artists who were generating the most revenue through their touring uh, during this time period? And I'll just read off the top 10. There's 40 groups listed here all together. We have U2, Bon Jovi, Pink Floyd, The Grateful Dead, David Bowie, Motley Crue, Whitney Houston, Huey Lewis and the News, Boston, and Alabama. Uh, so something of a mix of genres, but really pretty much rock is the center of everything. Um, you can scroll down and see to what extent that uh, mix of styles and artists continues. Um, I'll just point out the very lowest tier here. So the 40th top grossing tour of 1987 was the Run DMC BC Boys tour. Uh, since my talk is about rap, uh, I figure I should at least point that out. Um, okay, next we have a, the same list, but this is from 1999, so 12 years later. What I've done is I've excerpted the top 30 on the right side of the screen just so that it's a little easier to read because I know that the one on the left is a little bit small and hard to see. Um, Again, I'll, I'll just read out the top 10. We've got The Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, NSYNC, the Dave Matthews Band, Shania Twain, Cher, The Backstreet Boys, Elton John, The George Strait Country Music Festival, and Bette Midler. Um, and in this case, in the top 30, we've got two hip hop artists, two black hip hop artists listed uh, at number 25, Jay-Z and DMX. At number 27 is Lauren Hill. Uh, and so now we move ahead another 10 years. This is from 2009, same list. Polestar does this every year. Obviously, the last couple of years would look very different. I may say something about that at the end of uh, my time today. But um, for 2009, who are the top artists? You two. Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, Elton John and Billy Joel, Britney Spears, ACDC, Kenny Chesney, the Jonas Brothers, Dave Matthews Band, Fleetwood Mac, and Metallica. Uh, and here we have one hip hop artist represented in the top um, 30, which is Lil Wayne at number 26. So let me ask, um, see if we can do this here in our virtual space. Um, do people notice any trends on this list that are perhaps worth calling out? In terms of demographics, in terms of genre, anything along those lines. So one person says major artists are often from years ago, nostalgia tours. Yes, this is definitely one thing that stands out. Uh, mostly white artists at the top. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if we assume that, you know, the, I think proportion of African-Americans in the U.S. is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 12, 15%. Um, they are pretty significantly underrepresented here. Um, dinosaurs really earth once again, indeed. Uh, big infrastructure and tour support established. Yes, uh, this is an era when touring has become big business and I will say something more about that as I get more into my talk. 
a lot of males, maybe more male than female, absolutely. Uh, women are not unrepresented, but they're certainly underrepresented as well. Yeah. Um, barely no black rock artists represented at all. Yeah, basically, like if you're talking about rock proper, you did, there was, I think, whoops, uh, sorry. Yes, on, on the 1999 list, you have Lenny Kravitz at the number 49 top position on a tour in collaboration with the Black Crows. I'd say if you're describing black rock in sort of narrow terms, that's probably the only black rock artist who would qualify. Um, but even with hip hop that we know is a more squarely black identified genre, um, what we see is, you know, so 19, to contextualize a little, right? 1987, this is still pretty early in the history of hip hop, but um, it's also the start of what people would usually, what hip hop historians and critics would usually refer to as the golden age. Uh, and Run DMC was certainly one of the first groups to start to have major success as touring artists. And I'll say more about that as I get further into my talk as well. Um, and they are the only, along with the Beastie Boys, right, a white hip hop group, they are the only rap group on this list of top 40 from 1987. Uh, by 1999, hip hop has undoubtedly risen to be one of the top commercial genres in the US and I think global popular music with regard to record sales. But we see that there are all of two hip hop artists represented out of the top 50 of Polestar's top artists of the year. And for 2009, it's even fewer. Uh, out of the top 50, there's Lil Wayne. Um, and I think, let me just double check this, but the only other black artist, let alone regardless of genre on this list of top 50 touring artists for 2009 is Beyonce. So two out of 50 uh, is, is not representative, let's say. Uh, the point here, as maybe, I mean, obviously there's a lot of other things one can draw from. I mean, I think, you know, in a totally different vein, it would be pretty compelling to track the growing presence of country music on these charts over time. Uh, but that's a whole other talk. <laughs> what I want to point out is that this is representative of the historical pattern of the US live music industry, the underrepresentation of black artists as top touring artists has been institutionalized in the US live music industry pretty much from the start of this industry forward. And that has had significant impact on black artists across genres, but I would say it has had especially pronounced impact on black hip hop artists who have had difficulty establishing themselves as successful concert touring artists in ways that their white counterparts just have not had. Um, so that's the starting point for my presentation today. And what I want to build on from there is to um, look more closely at where hip hop fit into the live music industry during this period, primarily in the late 1980s and early 1990s when the hip hop uh, genre is really, again, like first gaining a major foothold in terms of record sales in a way that went beyond like the early success of say the Sugar Hill Gang with Rapper's Delight and such. Um, but really was, you know, pushing deeply into the charts by the end of the 1980s, um, you know, a string of like what are now considered classic hip hop releases by a host of different artists during these years. And yet we see this continual underrepresentation of hip hop artists where it comes to live music and the success in that sphere. Um, and so I want to think through how this became the case and what its implications are, but also to look closely at one case study having to do with the band Public Enemy of how a significant Black hip hop group of this era negotiated with these constraints and came up with a strategy to try to work around some of the limitations that they faced. And to then close, if there's time, with some further reflection on where things stand in the current, uh, right? well, at least in the 
recent pre-COVID climate, if not the absolutely current climate. Um, thank you for all your input getting that started. I, I was going to, um, that was my experiment to see if we could get a little participation going early and I was, I'm happy to see that worked, yay. And yay for the chat function of Zoom, right? Like it just opens up all kinds of things. Um, okay, so let me just first start with a little more broad reflection on the US live music industry. I mean, first of all, it needs to be said that, you know, the first of these charts I showed you is from 1987 and this is hardly the starting point of the pattern that I'm talking about. Um, that the unequal treatment of black artists in the music industry is of long standing for anybody who's looked closely at it. And um, that there are, of course, some very clear reasons as to why this is the case. As Lena was explaining in her talk, uh, anti black racism is a big part of that, uh, which has created a certain disposition uh, that has been at, at at best sort of suspicious and at worst like you know genuinely fearful and anxiety ridden when it comes to the notion of staging events that are primarily geared towards black audiences in the public sphere uh, and it's important to see that as a real crucial backdrop to the ways in which the live music industry has taken root because live uh, concerts and other live music events are some of the most significant public events, public commercial events that we have in our cultures, um, along with sporting events, I would say they're probably the, I think, the most important uh, in terms of gathering large crowds and creating a context in which public enjoyment can happen. Um, the industry, like what Murray had mentioned in the uh, chat about the growing infrastructure, that is a trend that really, I think, takes shape in the 1960s and 70s. This is the time when the arena concert economy becomes institutionalized as the sort of new normal of concert production. Um, and what we see happening uh, with arena rock is um, that arena concerts, as I put it in, in the larger book that I'm working on, uh, became the cornerstone of a move to industrialize the production of live music that was unprecedented in scope. There was just a sheer amount of dollars that were circulating through the production of arena concerts that had never existed before with regard to the live music economy. And uh, what that does, among other things, is it does generate this infrastructure in which there are a lot of key actors, uh, promoters, artists, managers, agents. So it's not just about like what the artists are doing, right? But it's also about who's choosing which artists are gonna play, who's choosing where they're going to play. All of these things come into uh, bearing on the ways in which artists may or may not have access to live music opportunities and live performance opportunities. And it's in that connection that I wanna talk about this era in the 1970s in particular, that's like the real, kind of principal era of growth with regard to the arena concert economy by focusing briefly on this one figure uh, who's named Frank Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona was an agent. Uh, so his job was to represent artists and get them work, right? Get them recording contracts, get them gigs. Um, somewhat unusually among agents, um, but very much representative of this moment in the history of the music industry writ large, Barcelona believed very strongly that touring was the primary thing that would allow artists to build audiences that would last. That, you know, you have a hit record and you may get a bunch of people buying that hit record, but will they buy the next hit record? Whereas if you get 10,000 people to come out to see a band every night on tour for 100 nights, you've much more, you're much more likely to have built an audience that's going to stick with that band. Like you've gotten an audience that's demonstrated their loyalty insofar as they've been willing to buy a ticket, sometimes more than one ticket. Uh, and so Barcelona threw himself into the promotion of live music through promoting his bands as live music attractions. Uh, his company was called Premier Talent Associates. You can see an ad for it from 1971 here on the left side of the screen. Um, it was started in 1965, and by the early 1970s, it was probably the single most significant artist rep agency in the industry, certainly where rock artists were concerned. I'll read you the names here because I'm sure they're hard to see. Who's on this list of artists he's representing? The Who, 
Grand Funk Railroad are the two at the top. Then you've got Mountain, Led Zeppelin, 10 Years After, Joe Cocker, Traffic, Jethro Tull, Yes, Jay Giles Band, Black Sabbath, uh, Humble Pie, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. So what happens as an artist, as an agent like Frank Barcelona becomes a major power broker in the music industry, and particularly so in the area of live music promotion, is that rock artists ascend to the top of the live music industry along with that. He, he was somebody who particularly made an effort to represent British rock artists in the American market. That was his specialty. Um, and it was through Barcelona and the people that he worked with that the arena concert phenomenon basically became by default to a large degree arena rock. You know, like that term is often used to refer to arena concerts more generally, even though a lot of these concerts don't actually feature rock performers, but arena rock is just like this sort of default term. And it's because artists like Barcelona, agents like Barcelona and the promoters who worked with him uh, saw rock as the most marketable commodity within this new economy that was growing around arena concerts, around live, around large scale live music production. One of the innovations that Barcelona made was in really allying himself with concert promoters who worked in different parts of the US. In the recent past, leading up to when his career really took off, promoters and agents often saw themselves as adversaries. You know, the agent was trying to get the best deal for the artist, the promoter was trying to get the best deal for himself, which meant often paying the artist a little less. And so they were at loggerheads a lot of the time, but Barcelona realized that like, if he wanted to achieve his ends, which was to allow his artists to tour as lucrative, lucratively and widely as possible, he needed the promoters to be on his side. So he worked out an arrangement with the promoters where there was a sort of quid, quid pro quo. And that took root early in his career, like certainly by the early seventies, these arrangements that he was working out were already starting to be, fall into place. Um, in this photo from 1974, what you see is a gathering of pretty much all the major concert promoters in the US, save maybe like a handful, uh, all gathered around with Barcelona to talk about how they could manage the industry so that they could satisfy all of their mutual interests as best they could. So if you can see my cursor here, I'll point out, this is Frank Barcelona here, sort of in the middle towards the back. Um, and what he would do is he would, all these promoters basically had control over a particular territory in the US, right? So there's like a guy who controls Boston, there's someone who controls New York, someone who controls parts of the Southwest, someone who controls parts of the Southeast. It's all very territory driven. Now promoters are also competing with each other, right? They wanna get competitive advantage over other people in their territory. Sometimes they might encroach on someone else's territory in order to like, you know, expand what they represent. What Barcelona did was he got the promoters to agree that if they stayed with their territory, um, he would ensure that they would have the top access to all the artists that he represented. So he would give them the first bid on any artist that he had touring. And if they all respected each other, what it meant was that an artist could more easily move from one location to the next location on their tours. And this allowed for the creation of a national network for touring at the arena concert level that had not existed before. So to just point out a few figures here that he would work with, uh, over here in the very top right is a guy named Barry Fay. Barry Fay was based in Denver, Colorado, and he controlled a significant territory from Denver down south into the southwest as far as like New Mexico and Arizona. This guy who's like almost smack dab in the middle is Larry Magid wearing the sunglasses. Larry Magid was based in Philadelphia and he was the top Philadelphia promoter. Nobody else in Philadelphia had the access to and control over the primary concert venues in that city. Um, he also owns several venues. So he, he definitely had an imprint there, akin to what Bill Graham had in the Bay Area in California. Bill Graham is actually up here, not far from Barry Fay. 
Um, the other guy I'll point out over here on the left side uh, is Jack Boyle. Jack Boyle was based in Washington, D.C., uh, but like uh, Barry Fay, he had a territory that stretched quite, a, quite south. So he had D.C., but he also controlled a lot of places in Virginia, Maryland, and all the way down to Florida. Right. So each of these guys has their little fiefdom. Barcelona says, I will give you exclusive access to my artists within your fiefdom if you respect each other's boundaries. And this network emerges. And so here's one representation of the network. This is from a Rolling Stones 1975 US tour. And um, you can just see like the interconnections that existed between all these promoters and Barcelona and other agents like him facilitated for a band like the Rolling Stones to be able to move readily from one of these cities to the next and to actually have a tour that they could put together with maximum profit, with maximum facility in moving from one location to the next, knowing that there was this venue there that was well set up to present the kind of show that they wanted to present and that would generate the most uh, revenue for everyone involved. Um, what's notable to point out here, and I've already gestured towards this, but I mean, if I go back here for a minute, you know, it's kind of like looking at that full star chart. Do you notice anything? <laughs> like they're all male and they're all white, right? And that homogeneity reproduced itself to a significant extent in the preferences that these promoters and agents brought to their work. It's not like black artists had no access to the arena touring economy, but they were definitely not given priority. Uh, the lack of black faces among this group of promoters meant that black promoters who might in fact understand what black audiences would be most interested in seeing and have the best access to venues that would particularly cater to black audiences of the time, were at a complete competitive disadvantage because they did not have access to the artists that were generating the most revenue who were making exclusive deals with all the people you see on the screen. So at both the business level where other people working in the concert industry were concerned, and then at the artist level in terms of which artists were able to get booked most easily into the best venues that would generate the most income, black artists, black promoters were definitely at a disadvantage all the way through this set of relationships. And Black audiences were considered to be a completely secondary consideration because they did were not seen as being as dependable um, in terms of just being ready to buy tickets and such. So you would see discussion in industry publications about things like um, it was really hard to sell out any show that was for Black audiences, you know? And you see this a lot where these assumptions about race are framed such that it makes it sound like you're just talking about numbers and data, but it's not just numbers and data. It's also about assumptions about who is reliably there to be marketed to. Um, this is basically the state of things when hip hop emerges as an attraction that is trying to enter into this field of relationships and become something that can become part of the touring economy that exists at the time. Um, now, early hip hop, very early hip hop, these are two flyers from around 1980, 79 and 80, you, the dates are on them as you can see, um, is a club-based phenomenon primarily. So the arena concert thing is like happening, happening in a whole other sphere uh, in their early careers, artists like Grandmaster Flash, and African Bombada, who were really definitive of early hip hop, were playing in clubs. And there was a often a very thin line between the disco club phenomenon that had been so prevalent in the mid to late 1970s and what was happening in early hip hop clubs. I mean, you can see with the Grandmaster Flash Flyer on the right from 1979, it's an event described as a disco extravaganza. This was not unusual in advertisements for early hip hop shows. Um, the Africa Bombada doesn't actually, event doesn't actually use the term disco, but, but one crucial carryover, of course, was that um, hip hop club shows and um, disco events were both largely predicated on uh, the priority of the DJ as being the primary figure who kind of made things happen. 
Um, and one of the things that became a kind of interesting uh, focal point as hip hop started to transition into more of the large scale concert economy was that um, audiences who were not part of this club culture were not used to just having a show where there was basically a DJ and an MC. So that became a you know, thing that audiences had to get used to when, when the music started moving into these other kinds of spaces. Um, which started to happen quite early in the in the genre's history. I, my next slide shows you one characteristic uh, bill that was happening as early as 1980. So this is a bill headlined, as you can see, by the uh, funk R&B group, the Commodores, right? One of the biggest black pop R&B groups of the 70s and 80s. Um, they're headlining Madison Square Garden, right? Which is basically like the predominant New York arena concert venue of its era. And, and I, you know, still to a degree today, um, the, it's a great bill, right? The Commodores, Bob Marley and the Whalers. And then at the bottom of the bill is Curtis Blow, who was one of the most prominent commercially successful early rap artists. Um, Curtis Blow was one of the first rap artists to really start to make significant moves into the arena concert economy. And he's, he, by 1979-80, he's regularly featuring as the opening act on bills uh, like this. He was not a headline attraction in the arena concert in, uh, realm. He was always a, an opening act in this phase of his career, but he went a long way towards making hip hop into something that could be presented in an arena concert setting um, and laid the groundwork for artists who followed him. Um, a more significant milestone came four years later when you get the Fresh Festival. Um, and Murray Foreman, who I know is on this chat uh, or on this Zoom call, has written about this as have others. Um, but the Fresh Festival was a real dedicated hip hop tour, right? So this is not like Curtis Blow opening up for some other kind of group. This is hip hop on tour in its own right. Uh, it's got, you know, corporate sponsorship with the Swatch Watch Company, which is a really significant milestone in terms of the business of hip hop. Uh, Dan Charnas, a really significant historian of the history of hip hop industry has written about it in that context. Um, you can see it has a real kind of cross section of some of the leading rap artists of this time period in 1984, headlined by Run DMC, whose own first record was still very fresh at this time. Uh, the Fat Boys, very popular group of this era. Curtis Blow. So, you know, Curtis Blow has now kind of progressed into this new setting. Houdini, another very major group from this time. But what's also crucial about the Fresh Festival is it's not just presenting rap artists as musicians, but also incorporating, as you can see, a number of breakdancing troops as well. So you get more of a wide representation of uh, hip hop culture, not just as the musical side, but, but the culture more broadly. Um, some indication of the impact of this tour came uh, when in 1998, the source uh, celebrating its its 100th issue had a bunch of you know lists that were like greatest this and greatest that of hip hop and for their most memorable hip hop tour to date in 1998 they chose the fresh festival so 14 years later it was still something that was being heralded as a breakthrough in the history of hip hop touring uh, it was it was promoted by an african american promoter named ricky walker so that's significant um you know he was not somebody who was pictured in that earlier uh, photo i showed you of promoters um, he was collaborating with people like Russell Simmons, whose Rush Artist Management was a really major uh, endeavor that was starting to give Black artists some artist representation that was facilitating this move into the concert arena in a way that hadn't happened. And the Fresh Festival as a tour grossed about three and a half million dollars, which was far more than any other hip hop tour had done up to this point. Two years later, in 1986, Red DMC kind of raises the stakes. Uh, you know, they they actually went out and headlined a second Fresh Festival in 1985. In 1986, they go out on a headlining tour of their own. It's titled after their current album of the time, Raising Hell, which was the commercial peak of their career. This was the album that included their crossover collaboration with Aerosmith and Walk This Way, 
which of course was really significant for being an early moment of crossover between rap and rock, something that I'm going to be coming back to. Um, and Run DMC seemed like they were unstoppable at this point. You know, they had a huge hit album. They were getting played on MTV, which at the time still had a very strong disposition towards white rock artists, just as the concert industry did. Uh, they were headlining their own tour, which is something very few or hip hop artists had ever had a chance to do before. Um, and then in the middle of it all, in August of 1986, they get to a tour stop at the Long Beach Arena in Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles. Um, and they hit a bit of a, a barricade, so to speak. Um, at this show on August 17th, 1986 at the Long Beach Arena, violence breaks out due to gang activity. Um, there are conflicting reports as to just who instigated the violence, but there were definitely rival gangs who were starting to get up on each other's space during the concert. And it became such a pronounced outbreak of violence during the concert that the concert had to be um, ended early. Run DMC actually never even got a chance to perform uh, during the show. The, the tour had a subsequent stop that was supposed to hit next at the Hollywood Palladium in LA proper. And that had to be canceled. Run DMC was very upset at what happened and were making public pronouncements that they thought the venue had not provided adequate security. Um, but in the public outcry around this, which was quite pronounced, um, Run DMC were blamed to, to far too often for being instigators of the violence, even though they hadn't even performed. Um, and this was not an isolated incident, unfortunately. Uh, it was one of a series of events that took root from 1985 forward, where the association between rap concerts specifically and violence became cause for public concern and outcry. Basically, a kind of moral panic came up, uh, as one sees so often through the history of popular music. And uh, as each event happened, you would get a snowballing of uh, media attention, uh, but also really significantly, you would get local police forces start to mobilize. Every time a rap concert would be happening, there'd be this sense that like trouble was gonna happen almost predictably. So police would make it much, much harder to be able to stage these events without a kind of security that made them almost prohibitive. Concert promoters and venue managers became highly suspicious of producing rap shows. Um, and so by the time you get to the late 1980s, it is harder and harder to put rap shows on. Um, and so what you see here, this is from, by the time you get to the early 1990s, the source, which is probably the single leading hip hop publication in the US at this time, is reporting on just how difficult it is to produce rap concerts and, and even get to see a rap concert, at least on the sort of big scale of the sort of arena shows that had become so standard in the industry by this time. Uh, the 1991 headline from the source is banned in the USA. In 1990, rap concerts became an endangered species. This is another case of the anti-rap forces getting their way. In 1997, you have an article titled Fear of a Rap Concert. This is a play on public enemies album title from a few years earlier, Fear of a Black Planet. Uh, and then the headline there, or the subheadline, you know, finding it impossible to catch your favorite rap artist live on the regular. The drought in hip hop concerts is about more than the weather. Uh, I think what's really significant here is that, uh, you know, these are six years apart, right? This is like, our, by 1997, you're like, more than 10 years after the Long Beach Arena incident with Run DMC. So what we get a sense of is just how chronic this is, that rap concerts by the late 80s and early 90s have run into a place where there's almost like an automatic association between rap concerts and violence and public disorder. And this makes it harder and harder to even produce these concerts in the first place. And what's really important to recognize is that um, it's not like hip hop had a monopoly on violence at live music events, right? Like why did this become such a prevalent association? 
uh, it had a lot to do with pre-existing conditions, shall we say. Um, you know, back in her classic study, Black Noise, from 1994, Tricia Rose wrote about this with regard to NWA and other key hip-hop artists of the late 80s, um, describing how a kind of moral panic had grown around hip-hop concerts that, in her words, derived from a pre-existing anxiety regarding rap's core audience, Black working-class youths, who mainstream media outlets were already disposed to portray as violent offenders. And so what results is described in the uh, one of the source articles by Gary Bongiovanni, who is the editor of Polestar magazine, uh, who says, rap simply isn't a fixture on the concert scene. There are lots of concerns on the part of facility managers and promoters, not because of the music, but because of past problems with shows and because of what might happen outside the show, they have difficulty obtaining liability insurance. And this was a key thing. Insurance rates for rap shows were growing way higher than for any other genre of performance, and it made it hard for a promoter to even put one of these shows on. Where the concert economy was concerned, rap had become trapped in the vicious cycle. Uh, the association between rap concerts and violence had assumed the status of common sense. Um, so I'm now going to transition into talking about public enemy. Uh, but this is basically where things stand when public enemy emerges onto the scene in 1987. That uh, it is inc already increasingly hard for rap artists to get spots on tours, for rap tours to get booked, and to get the kind of production support that white rock artists, for instance, could ex kind of expect as a matter of course once they'd reached a certain plateau of success. Um, Public Enemy releases their first album in 1987, Yo Bum Rush the Show. Because they're on Def Jam Records, which is, you know, one of the leading promoters of hip hop recording artists during the time, and Def Jam was also aligned with Russell Simmons's Rush Artist Management, um, Public Enemy was able to start actively touring with a decent amount of support from fairly er from early in their career. You can see here they're pictured as part of two key touring packages in 1987. One is the Def Jam tour that also includes LL Cool J and Houdini. And in another package, they're touring with the Beastie Boys. Um, Public Enemy headlines a tour of their own for the first time in 1990. And this is the tour of a Black Planet. So this is in connection with their uh, 1990 album, Fear of a Black Planet. You can see the itinerary for part of the tour on the left side of the screen. Uh, I got this from the Cornell Hip Hop Archive, where they have a lot of great material that allows you to get inside some of these issues. Um, and on the right, you can see a Rolling Stone magazine review of one of the stops on the tour. Um, the tour for, for the tour of a Black Planet was a genuine arena rap tour. Arena rap is a term I have coined to as a sort of counterpart to arena rock to sort of get away from that default sense that arena concerts equal rock. Um, I think arena rap is a phenomenon that needs to be talked about more in hip hop scholarship and historiography. And that's one of the main contributions I'm trying to make here with this kind of research. Um, but kicking off with a June 27th concert at the Coliseum in Richmond, Virginia, um, the tour kept Public Enemy and tour maze Kid and Play and Heavy D and the Boys on the road until the first days of September. Compared to many of their peers, Public Enemy had a form, far more theatrical stage show than most. Um, the core trio of Chuck D, MC, Sidekick, Flavor Flav, and DJ Terminator X were joined by the imposing S1W security force, the members of which assumed militant poses on stage that drove home the group's Black Panther Party style of political rhetoric. The resulting concerts blended political oratory, dense assemblages of beats and riffs, Black nationalist iconography, and the dizzying interplay between Chuck D and Flavor Flav to stirring effect, leading Rolling Stone critic Alan Light in the article that you see pictured here on the right, to pronounce Public Enemy as powerful on stage as any group today. And one of the key elements that enabled Public Enemy to maintain their visibility and gain bookings as live artists when many other hip hop performers struggled was the group's alignment with rock music aesthetics and their strategic alliances with white rock artists. 
Um, the intersection of rock and rap had been building going back to the time of Run DMC and Walk This Way, but Public Enemy definitely pushed it forward. And not only with the music they made, but I think really importantly also with um, the, uh, the way in which they shared bills and stages with white rock artists, which was not something that had happened much at all up until this point. Um, so Chuck D wrote in his memoir about how in 1991, the group had three different tours playing in front of three entirely different audiences in order to expand our audience without alienating any of them. In the span of six months, we knocked out an alternative tour with Sisters of Mercy, a thrash metal tour with Anthrax and Primus, and from December to January, we did the world's greatest rap tour, which featured Queen Latifah, Naughty by Nature, Ghetto Boys, Tribe Called Quest, Jazzy Jeff, and the Fresh Prince, and the leaders of the new school. So this was a really significant move. Like the early 90s being such a weird transitional time when hip hop artists were facing these constraints, and Public Enemy is very strategic. Like if we're going to have trouble getting booked on our own terms, we're going to get booked on the terms that the concert industry will take us seriously. We're going to align, oursel align ourselves with white rock artists and we're going to ride on coattails, but also we're going to make ourselves heard in this whole other way. Um, the source again reports on this in 1991 in an article titled, as you can see here, Beats, Turntables, and Guitar Solos, and really acknowledges that um, what Public Enemy is doing here is a way to negotiate around the difficulty that Black hip hop artists are facing. That if you can't get booked as a hip hop artist in your own right, get on the bill with white rock artists. Of course, not all hip hop artists have that opportunity. Public Enemy was sort of uniquely positioned to take advantage of this. Um, this is also the same year that the Lollapalooza Festival debuts and includes Ice-T. There are a few hip hop artists who are able to move in this direction. It's not something that most able, are able to do. Um, this is a review from the New York Times from the first of the tours that Chuck D had described when um, Public Enemy is playing with Sisters of Mercy, who are kind of a goth rock group, with Gang of Four, the post-punk band, uh, with a kind of heavy rock group called Warrior Soul, and then with this other hip hop group called Young Black Teenagers, who are actually a bunch of white guys, really bad name. Um, but what you see here, John Perellis, the New York Times um, critic, describes what he refers to as a mix and match show, right? This mix and match of white rock and black hip hop artists. And he really kind of, again, highlights that this is not just a matter of like mixing different musical styles, but it's really a kind of maneuver to circumvent the difficulties that rap artists face in getting concert bookings. Uh, the mix and match tour grows out of idealistic and practical considerations. The ideal is to convene a post-punk community from factionalized rock audiences. The practicality is that because insurers are so leery of violence at rap shows, Promoters rarely book all rap bills. Joining rock bands on the road helps rappers to get out and perform. Um, so this also underpins, I'm gonna skip ahead a little. This also underpins the next uh, such collaboration that Pub Public Enemy undertakes touring with Anthrax on a tour that also included uh, the group Primus. And uh, this was a very enthusiastic LA Times review of one of their concerts on this tour, which I think artistically and in some ways politically was considered to be a more successful undertaking than the tour with Sisters of Mercy. Um, and it also kind of made more musical sense because Anthrax, as many of you I'm sure know, actually covered Public Enemy's Bring the Noise and they collaborated on the song together. Uh, and they would play the song together during the concerts. And I, I wanted to just play a little snippet of that because I think it's a pretty powerful indication of what the um, alliance of rap and rock could achieve in the sort of live music setting. So let me get here. Now California for you and yours. Anthrax and the rebels without a pause. Repeat to you, Anthrax and Public Enemy. And yo oh, sorry about that. Damn it. All right, let's try that again. Now, California for you and yours. Anthrax and the rebels without 
Anthrax and the Rebels without a pause. Repeat to you, Anthrax and Public Enemy. And yo, Scotty, what we gonna do, G? Bring the noise! All right, I'll stop it there just in the interest of time. Uh, I, sh I think I should probably start to wrap up soon, uh, but I'll just say, so moving from this, uh, so Public Enemy does this tour with Sisters of Mercy. They do this tour with Anthrax. Then at the end of the year, 1991, they do their own tour where they're headlining with only hip hop artists. And what's significant here is that I think in large part due to the momentum that they had from aligning with these white rock artists, now Public Enemy actually is getting booked in a way that a rock artist might get booked. So they play at Madison Square Garden in a headlining show. It's the first rap show at Madison Square Garden for four years. Uh, and all the publicity about it is whether there's gonna be violence, right? So the folks at Madison Square Garden stress that they're very prepared. And if you can read this at the very bottom of the clipping here, it says the plans include 12 metal detectors and more than 100 guards for an audience that could exceed 19,000. And this was very new in early 90s that you would have all these metal detectors and stuff at shows. We've now become, I think, a lot more used to it, but people write about it at the time as though it's like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to do this. It's like getting on a flight. Um, so that's significant in its own right. But the publicity all winds up being like, when, when the concert actually happens, oh my God, nobody got killed. Like all the New York newspapers are basically like, this went well, we're so surprised. So what's striking here is that the lack of violence, the absence of violence becomes what is newsworthy for when it comes to hip hop by the early nineties. Um, and, you know, Public Enemy has managed to stage themselves effectively but they've done so in a way where, you know, you can raise questions as to whether they had to compromise on some level in order to make this happen for themselves. Uh, and so I wanna kind of end this phase of the presentation with Chuck D kind of commenting on that because there was some pushback. There were people who were like, look at Public Enemy, like they're, they're kind of selling out. They're like going on rock tours. What about playing for black audiences, uh, which, a lot of the accounts of these shows with groups like Anthrax were making it clear that the audience was very much predominantly white. Um, but this was Chuck D's response. You know, why did I do tours with U2 and Anthrax? So I could learn what I'm missing. If rock exists for 20 years, how come rap got severe problems now? In this country, the US, there's no such thing as a 100% autonomous black situation. Um, and so, Public Enemy managed to successfully negotiate these challenges, but hip hop remained in a place of subordination where the live music industry was concerned. We saw that in those pull star charts and I'll just end really quickly. If we look at 2019, right? The most recent data we have from a normal concert year and Rolling Stones, Alton John, Bob Seger, Pink, Ariana Grande. These are the top touring artists of 2019 in the US. You know, so that nostalgia tour thing is even more strongly entrenched, but also top 50 artists, there's almost no hip hop here at all. Nothing has changed. So this is, a, well, Post Malone is the only one and he's white. So have, have, have we moved on? I would say no. And, and as we start to think about what it will mean to open up reopen the concert economy, I think we need to think a lot more about why these relationships continue to reproduce themselves. Uh, I will end there and I, I look forward to your questions.
yeah thank you very much steve very insightful Thanks. um i was just wondering because i've had the chance to look at your presentations be, uh, before if you were uh, including some of the newspaper articles in your book um, because they were really interesting to read. I think it, I spent several hours just reading all the newspaper articles. Of course, we didn't have time today. So just right. uh, just a quick question. Um, are you including any of these materials in your book? So if people... If yeah, absolutely. All, all of this. I mean, I may not be reproducing all of the actual article texts, right? Because that would then cost money. Um, but uh, I am absolutely... These are all sources I quote at length. Uh, so uh, it's always fun putting a presentation together to get to kind of do the show and tell, right? I mean, and of course I have, I don't even want to say how much more I have than what I was able to show, but uh, there's, there's, there's quite a stash there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's also how you get a sense of the trends, like that it's, it's not an isolated thing when you, you know, you look at one article and you see like rap violence, but then you see like 50 you know, all from like a three day period. And it's like, yeah, this is this is really entrenched. Uh, yeah, we are already right in the discussion. I'm not sure if you've seen the, the chat during your talk. But, okay. uh, yeah, it was quite, quite um, yeah, active. And we have Good. the first um, question by Murray. If you want to. Uh, peace, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, peace family, and uh, you know, good to see everybody here. And uh, Steve, as ever, thanks, brother. You know, you do the work. <laughs> you. Um, you know, um, I'm just a couple of things. Um, um, Jan asked about the um, the newspaper articles and that sort of thing. I, I have one question: um, Did you interview, or have you, or do you intend to interview anybody like Chuck about their approach to uh, you know to scaling up uh, their concert activity? That's one question. And then the other one that's interesting, and this also comes back to Chuck and Public Enemy, and to see that last listing, to see Rolling Stones right at the top. Mm -hmm. um, in my interviews with Chuck and with LL and with even Grandmaster Kaz and these cats, they all point to the Rolling Stones, all of them. And Chuck's line, his quote is, we want to be the Rolling Stones of rap. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about that idea of scaling up to a large, a large arena and that sort of thing, the history of that now, and, and, and he alludes to it in that last quote you give, it's also got something traced onto longevity, right? Oh. The capacity to, to be a, an event and remain an event for, you know, till how old, you know, Charlie Watts is approaching 80, right? Um, yeah. Chuck would like to see that for hip hop and see that for public enemy. So, it, so it's interesting how, you know, on the one hand there's infrastructure and, and there's industry and all these things, but there are other considerations going on about, you know, you know what it means to be a, an event band. And of course, to be an event, you wanna play in the bigger venues and that sort of thing as well. Yeah. That's a great point. I'll, I can answer your first question really quickly, which is to say, no, I have not interviewed Chuck. Um, I, I've never been one who puts primary focus on interviews, uh, partly because, you know, the, my larger project covers 150 plus years. And, it, you know, obviously archival work is what makes the early history go. And I, I prefer sort of methodological consistency, I guess, along those lines. Um, and I also, have, you know, because live music is still something that's not written about in the way that it should be, to my mind, um, there's just so much material that's still not well mined in terms of like, what can we do by looking at tour itineraries? What can we do by, um, you know, just sitting through the discourse, which I know you've done a ton of too. And I, you know, like your discussion of, live hip hop in um, The Hood Comes First, I think is one of the really important resources out there that takes live performance seriously in hip hop studies. It's mostly not very prominent at all, as I'm sure you know. So, um, so no, I haven't had a chance to talk with Chuck. I definitely, um, you know, have read everything I could to get a grounding on his perspective on what you, you refer to as scaling up. Um, and I mean, I, I actually thought his memoir was really, really helpful. He had a lot to say there. And what I find really interesting also in reading like Jay-Z's Decoded uh, is that you read these artists and you see that live music really mattered a lot for them. Like when they thought about their careers, it was really central in a way that nobody captures when they write about these artists, you know, 
um, at least not in anything that I've read. And so I, I, I was really struck by how much Chuck talks about how important it was to put on a certain kind of show. And um, I actually quote that stuff at some length in parts of this chapter that I had to cut for time purposes here. Um, so that's mostly the kinds of resources I've used for, for putting this together. Um, where the Rolling Stones are concerned, though, yes, I totally hear what you're saying. And I, and it, I think what I hear Chuck alluding to in that last quote I used was that there's a certain sense of what it means to have a career that artists like you 2 and the Rolling Stones have been able to pr produce for themselves in the rock realm. And he wants rap artists like himself, but others to be able to do that the same way. And it's precisely what is harder to do if having that sort of equitable access to the concert industry is not provided because that's really the key to longevity, right? I mean, the Stones, long after the point at which their new releases are really considered to be super relevant, continue to generate record-breaking revenues as a touring attraction. Um, you know, the highest grossing single concert event ever produced was the desert, uh, uh, I'm spacing on the name of it, but the, the Coachella for old people, right? That they had a few years ago where it was like the Stones, the Who, Bob Dylan, Paul McCartney, um, you know, that grossed more than any other single live music event ever. Old Cella, exactly. Um, and so the, the market has skewed more and more in the direction of supporting heritage artists, if we want to call them that. Um, I don't think hip hop artists have enjoyed that to the same degree, you know, and just as they haven't enjoyed access to live music bookings in general. So I absolutely think you're right that this is about what it means to have a career and about, you know, it's almost like what some of Jay-Z's points about like what really matters here is, is inherited wealth, right? Like that sense of like, it's not just about your salary, right? But it's about what do you have in the bank so that you can like invest in the next thing you want to do and have an assured future. Yeah. And live music is, is absolutely the thing that allows that to happen, I think, for artists over the long term. So thanks for your question, Murray. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, Mark, if you could keep it brief, if possible. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Great, Perfect. thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Really enjoyed that. Um, I suppose just um, just sort of thinking back to your that, that wonderful picture, that period piece picture of all the slightly organized crime looking uh, syndicate of, um, uh, of promoters. Um, and right. I just sort of looked at that and I wondered sort of where, for example, somebody like James Brown would fit into or not fit into that, that sort of world of touring with those promoters or even on a label level, um, businesses like, like Stax or whoever on a regional who, who, who had some appeal nationally across the States at least. Was, was that a sort of parallel world and the two never met or were there you know, was there a bit of an, an underground sort of version of that syndicate that probably would host sort of established and, and quite well-known black artists and black labels and showcases? Uh, I just wondered if you'd sort of um, found anything in your research around around those lines, around the, what connections there were or weren't to the sort of more household name, sort of black, black music um, artists and, and businesses at the time. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, historically, I think, the the chitlin circuit is famous right like chitlin circuit is famous as this really was a parallel realm where black concert artists who were touring would rely on and it was very much a product of segregation um the venues were largely segregated uh the infrastructure was predominantly black run but it also worked on a much smaller scale than the sort of bigger concert industry and you know, by the time you get into the arena concert period, there are vestiges of the Chitlin circuit that are definitely still around. There's also this sort of next level up from it, which is like the Apollo, the Howard Theater, these historically black theaters, not all of which are owned by black uh, business people by any means, right? So the ownership issue is always a sticking point. Uh, there are promoters who are definitely helping artists to get bookings in those venues, black promoters. Um, 
Black promoters, though, as I alluded to, are to a large degree shut out from the biggest level of the economy. That doesn't mean that they had no access at all, um, but they had to fight for access. And so um, for Black artists, whether it be James Brown or George Clinton, um, it, one of the biggest decisions they had to make was how much it mattered to them to work with a black promoter or whether they were willing to go into collaboration with white promoters, which would probably allow them to get better bookings, but also kind of made them feel a little bit like they weren't working for the race, you know? And Clinton actually, the, the two artists who've really written about this most uh, insightfully in memoirs are George Clinton and Maurice White from Earth, Wind and & Fire. And both of them talk about how much they wanted to work with black artists and or black promoters when they were touring and how hard it was to do so. That they felt like they were always having to make a compromise in one direction or another. Uh, and, you know, they were two of the biggest black touring artists of their time, like in the seventies and eighties, like they really didn't get much bigger than that. James Brown, I think probably did rely more. I haven't specifically looked at him as closely. Um, I think he did rely more on a circuit of black promoters and there definitely were a few. Um, and I think to some degree, he just sort of went where black audiences were most likely to go. He was a little, he, he saw it as being less advantageous to his own, I think, career model to put more priority on venues where there was more likely to be a predominantly white audience, uh, at least in the phase of his career that like would fall into the period that uh, I'm talking about. Um, so there were parallel worlds to a significant degree. Um, and there were, you know, I think the biggest indication of that is that uh, at a certain point, I think in the 80s, um, a group of about 15 Black promoters actually sued uh, in order to get more equal representation in the concert industry, claiming like outright discrimination. And um, they didn't get very far, like, because even though there seems to be a lot of pretty compelling evidence. Like it wasn't evidence that really held up very well in court. Um, but the sheer fact that they were motivated to bring that suit shows just how much there was a gulf. Um, and, you know, they could try to create their own institutions, but their own institutions would always have been working at a competitive disadvantage. Yep. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, yeah, I think we can have another final uh, round of applause this great presentation. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, we still have 10 minutes, which should be enough for a quick coffee. And then we are back for our final session. And if then there's still um, uh, the desire to talk and discuss further, then we can come back and uh, yeah, come back to the previous presentations. See you in uh, 10 minutes.
Hey Steve, how you doing? Hussein. Um, you're on, you're muted. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it, it's it's great to meet another Hendrix fan. <laughs> and so, it's it's really cool. It, it's um, I was very interested in your presentation. I mean, one of the things I was going to put in the chat, but I decided not to. You know, in um, Richard Peterson's article with um, Anand about the introduction of SoundScan, like the they did that study like 18 months pre, prior to the introduction and 18 months post. And in terms of the, what the kind of the billboard chart <clears throat> kind of revealed in terms of sales patterns, under reporting, all the rest of those sorts of things. And what they saw was the, uh, they described as the emergence of hip hop and, and essentially a difficulty to try and get break into the mainstream chart. So they had to kind of create the, the kind of the sideways kind of, uh, uh, kind of new artist type sort of uh, emerging genre type kind of charts until they built up enough of a, of a kind of a <clears throat> support in terms of a following to be able to transfer it over to the mainstream chart. <clears throat> so I was wondering whether, whether you'd done any kind of looked at any kind of correspondence between the touring thing <laughs> and the change in terms of uh, the charts uh, and, and, and how what kind of influence that might have. Sorry, I know there are many minutes left, but there we go. Yeah, um, I haven't looked at that in any kind of systematic way. You know, it's obvious that, uh, I mean, I, to me, what's so striking is that it's precisely at that moment in the early 90s when you get that changeover when sound scan is being put in place and you get like NWA suddenly going to number one um, that all the stuff I was talking about is actually like gaining momentum. You know, I think on some level, those two things do kind of go hand in hand, which is to say that the increased commercial visibility of hip hop made it more imperative that hip hop was kind of contained, yeah. you know, um, especially when it was being identified with the sort of, with with an NWA, right? with that sort of act. Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm kind of really interested that, 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 that Billboard didn't make kind of a, a, a code word race genre chart for them and, and just kind of like they, they really aimed, I mean, it depends whether they were, they were kind of lobbied precisely for that sort of thing to actually create a kind of an incubated chart that would then allow them to transition over into the much more mainstream kind of chart rather than do the segregation thing and say, okay, you're over there, <laughs> you know? So I, I was, I was surprised about their, their kind of move because it seemed despite the fact of all of the, the violence associations and so on and all the reports, they didn't see to um, segregate, I suppose is, is uh, what I'm saying. Didn't the story the means of making it inclusive. Sorry. You're saying they didn't segregate the charts? No, what I'm saying is, is that they could have segregated them and just stuck them in a in a kind of a, a hip hop kind of like done done the same thing like R and B and whatever else and just right, stuck right, them right. off rather than use use it as a launch pad into the mainstream chart. Mm. So they therefore sort of create a kind of a an audience for it, have enough of prove their sustainability and then cross over. I suppose. Yeah, well, I'm sure you know that like uh, that use of the segmented charts has always had some controversy, right? I mean, how many different names have the black music charts gone under, right? uh, you know? And then at a certain point, they all actually did disappear in the 60s. And then it was kind of a problem that they disappeared. So then they brought it back. But yeah, uh, I, I think that Billboard you know, they don't always make the best decisions about that stuff, but I think they're always aware of the PR aspect of like what charts they have and what they're named and all of that. Um, I don't know much about the background. I mean, it, it always surprises me that there isn't more research actually being done on precisely like who decides what the charts are named and what conversation, right? Like, I, I had an email from a graduate. Listen, man, I had an email from a graduate. I mean, they graduated in 2008, right? And they were like, my album is the largest selling indie album in gospel. Uh, it sold like something like 160,000 units, you know? He said, and they've told me I'm not eligible for the chart. <laughs> right. right? It's, 
sales in only certain areas are counted and sales in general are not, you know, in, in the wide sense of everything that's sold in the country. So that's the UK, you know. Yeah, it, it's a weird thing. Um, but I think that, you know, if, if one were to try to do that kind of research, you would automatically hit this reality that I think that information is so closely guarded. Yeah. Uh, like the people who make those things don't want you to know how they're put together. It's very much the Wizard of Oz kind of situation. <laughs> you know, yeah. Behind the screen. Um, <laughs> And, yeah, you know, the concert industry has worked in much the same way. Uh, you know, like the pole star data um, is accessible up to a point, but for the most part, if you really want to get access to all that stuff, you've got to pay your like six hundred dollar annual subscription, yeah. even to like get your foot in the door, yeah. uh, which is kind of absurd. I mean, it's it's so not geared towards like ready public accessibility. It's it's geared towards this is data that's really here for other industry people to use to make good market decisions. Yeah. Um, One of the things I, I wanted to ask you is because in, in the UK, a lot of uh, kind of concert promoters, certainly around in, in, the, in the 50s, 60s and, and early 70s, very much came from kind of sport or they were like Peter Grant, you know, they would come from wrestling and so on. So it, it was was that sort of similar in the in the States in terms of your I think it was it was uh, Mark that referred to it as a as a kind of a murder ink type of organization. They do have that look to them. Um, <laughs> well, that that, there, there's a whole story I could tell about that. That's pretty funny. But I I that would given that we're going to start the next panel in a minute, I'm not going to get into it. Um, but uh, that was less the case by the time you get to the arena concert period. Most of the folks who got into promoting um were really like fans of rock and started out working with rock there were a, there were a couple who were a little older who got into it through other channels but uh you know you don't even have so much of the, like i know you know simon frith and his co collaborators have done this whole study of the british live music industry and they talk a lot about how um college colleges and universities were a really important launching pad I used to watch them every Saturday afternoon on the BBC. I used to watch those programs. Yeah, but that's great. It's so interesting to to, start to bring together that research. I think I can see that you've been having a really um, thriving conversation during the break, and we've got time at the end of today to continue those discussions. And I'm really sorry to cut you off. You now. Are very diplomatic. Very, 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 you're very diplomatic. I get it. <laughs> I try. <laughs> But I'm really yeah. absolutely um, thrilled to um, introduce our next speaker, Thank you, Steve. Paula Wolf. And uh, Paula is a researcher in the fields of music production, the independent music industry and gender. And she's the author of Women in the Studio, Creativity, Control and Gender in Popular Music Sound Production, which is a very exciting read. So well worth picking up a copy. Um, the book's been nominated for the Excellence in Historical Recorded Sound Research Award and um, the Association for Recorded Sounds Award and the IASPAM Book Prize as well. Not only that, but Paula is a critically acclaimed singer, songwriter and producer, self-producing and self-releasing on her own label since the turn of the century. So do look her up on your preferred streaming services. So welcome, Paula. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I'm just going to share what I need to share. Okay, can you see that, Rosie? Just give me a thumbs up, yeah? Okay. All right, cool. So, songwriting, music production, self-production, locating the emotion, maintaining the objective and positioning genre. So, Instinctively, I've always kept uh, my own, following Rosie's kind introduction there, I've always kept my own music making, producing and performing very, very separate from my academic research and writing. Even though it has formed the consistent backdrop to it, has fueled it, has allowed me an insider's view, and has given me access to different industry communities, particularly within the UK independent sector. 
I have to admit that the idea of using my own experiences within the studio as the basis for inquiry has always made me feel distinctly uncomfortable. Autoethnography fills me with fears of lacking critical distance. And using my own creative processes and subsequent work as subjects for critical analysis has always made me fear that the creative process would be forced or false somehow and fills me with horrors of producing substandard, overly self-conscious work under the forgiving banner of research. But I do think about the issues I'm going to touch on today concerning the self-production process a lot. And my current, recent and current work that has actually involved reworking some very, very early songs as part of the forthcoming reissue of my back catalogue due to some technical issues highlighted by the remastering process, as well as the fact that some of those old songs just weren't good enough to re-release, has helped me to crystallize, organize and articulate some of those thoughts. I've also come to realize following a presentation I gave at the University of Agda in Norway last November, last November hosted by Stan, Stan Hawkins, that in spite of my maintaining my practice alongside my research, as opposed to practice as research, the what Stan eloquently referred to as the my experiences as an artist producer and how this intersects with my scholarly work may be of interest, in fact, to postgraduate students who are grappling with the task of finding meaningful ways in which they might position or situate their own practice or aspirations for creative practice within an academic framework. I said in November how I've been saying to academic friends and to students for years <laughs> that it feels like it's the same bit of the brain that hears the right sounds when producing a piece of music to seeing the right connections when constructing a piece of scholarship. I didn't then, and nor do I now, have any empirical evidence to substantiate such a claim. I'm no psychologist. But I explained how, I suppose, autoethnographically speaking, I've come to realize that these processes are quite simply about perception, about getting it in whatever art form and in whatever academic field. I also said that what I've come to appreciate is the monumental impact of acquiring the confidence, firstly, to believe your interpretation of what it is you're perceiving, and then the confidence in your skill to craft something as a result, whether that be a piece of produced music or an academic essay. Which leads me on to the specific focus for today's presentation, because nowhere, nowhere is such confidence, hard one in my case, needed than in the act of self-production where each of the self-designated roles, songwriter, vocalist, instrumentalist, composer, arranger, recording engineer, producer, mix engineer, and perhaps also mastering engineer, although not that final one in my case, requires not just objectivity, as I'll discuss below, but absolute trust in the most important tool we have, our ears. And you can only trust your ears if you have the confidence to believe in the aesthetic process you're, you're pursuing using the tools at hand and to be faithful to that process, even if what comes out at the end is not to everyone's or indeed to anyone's taste. So a couple of analogies to set the scene and establish what is quite a specific context for today's discussion. In, oh, let's see if this is working, hold on. There we go. In chapter two of my book, Women in the Studio, 
I draw on the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge to establish an analogy for the production process I've just alluded to. Having famously described poetry as being the best words in their best order, I suggest that just as a finished poem encompasses a poet's weaving of theme, language, structure, rhythm, and poetic devices to express as effectively as is possible her his response to the world within a densely structured art form, so too a song that has been produced also encompasses a marriage of theme, language, melody, structure, rhythm, and possible employment of any number of instruments or created sounds to express an artist's response as effectively as possible within a densely structured art form. I then complete the analogy by saying that a fully produced piece of music might be described as the best sounds in their best order and describe how a music producer is witness to the enactment of the recording process of such a marriage and tries to ensure that each individual section is performed, recorded, and then mixed in such a way as to ensure that the song communicates exactly what the artist intended and to the best of her, his ability. In essence, however, the analogy is far better suited to clarify and describe the work of an artist producer who, rather than being a witness to such an enactment, creates and navigates the construction, production, recording and mixing of every strand of that densely structured art form herself. We are now all familiar with the term the art of record production or the art of music production, but it is specifically the art of self-production that compels all that I do. And it is some of the characteristics of that process that I'm going to examine today, drawing on some of these reworkings, still very much in progress to illustrate. <laughs> so the quality of what you'll be hearing aside, I need to stress that every production choice I've made since I first started teaching myself how to produce a very, very long time ago, having spent many a, a decade or more teaching myself how to write songs, having spent an entire childhood singing in various guises, has been the result of the fact that I work with song. I don't write EDM or electronic pop or experimental music or beats alone. I don't write the music and then try to make a melody and lyric to fit on top like a top liner. The lyrics, the songs come first, they come fully formed and they are the starting point. Furthermore, I've never been motivated by the pursuit of a commercial sound or producing a hit, ticking the latest sonic boxes with the latest kit, but rather have been led quite simply by the need to sonically manifest and best represent the core theme or what I've described as the heart of each song that I write using the tools at hand and the spaces in which I found myself. Now, a similar point is made by Catherine Williams, the first singer-songwriter I formally interviewed, first on MySpace in 2007, and then in person a year later. She stated how she wanted to look back at a song she'd recorded in 20, 30 years time and be able to say, yes, that's exactly what I meant. Such a desire has been my guiding principle also, and is one that has been at the very forefront of my mind in this current reworking, as I now find myself looking back at songs that I wrote 20, 30 years ago. And although I have been able to say, by and large, yes, that's what I meant. However, I felt the need to say it a bit better. And so poetry, again, has offered a useful perspective when thinking about songwriting in this reworking task not least because what at first appeared an onerous task, necessitating delaying work on my fourth album and other creative and re research projects has proved to be in fact a highly valuable process. Not just in terms of thinking about self-production, but about the nature of creativity itself. And I don't mean the situation of creativity addressed by Csikszent Mihaly and those popular music scholars who've drawn on his work to examine the collaborative nature of creativity among songwriters in a band scenario, or when working with producers and engineers in a commercial studio. What has interested me rather are the triggers a solo artist has to create or construct for herself 
in order to instigate an emotional response, which in turn will result in the creativity that takes place. Specifically, I've been reminded, yeah, I've been reminded of William Wordsworth's famous proclamation that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. Now these words have resonated, not least as there has been a double twinned recollection, not just concerning the emotion that had propelled the very writing of the songs in some cases nearly 30 years ago, but concerning the very emotion I had faithfully and naively as ever, attempted to communicate through my production choices. Even if my fledgling attempts were not a little clunky, clumsy, and in some cases toe curling and distorted. Despite all of this, I had captured something, the emotion. And it is that that has, despite hopefully being able to play a bit better and have a, a better system, logic instead of cakewalk, and a better space with good natural acoustics instead of what was there in a back bedroom in a Manchester terrace where I was living at the time, that's been the hardest thing. And has had me going back to SoundCloud and listening again and again to particular phrasing in the vocal and guitar lines, not through wanting to recreate the same thing, but needing to maintain the integrity of the original song. And so in trying to reinterpret these two interconnected sets of emotion, if you like, I've become increasingly aware of how particular aspects of and approaches to the songwriting and self-production process have helped during this requisite second round of recollecting, of reworking ideas, necess necessitating my desire to remain faithful to the emotional source of origin whilst wanting the songs to sound fresh and worthy eventually of reissue or release. So I've tried to separate out these different approaches as I've observed them. And as I've said, I'll be drawing on some very, very short, very, very roughly mixed samples to illustrate. So the song is still the thing. Without any doubt, any problems I may encounter in the production stage, generally, but most notably here in this reproduction, is because the song itself, the melody, the lyrics aren't right or they aren't good enough. The song has to stand up on its own. We've got so much at our fingertips. One of the pitfalls we can fall into is to confuse great production ideas for a great song. Arguably, this has always been the case, but never more so than now. I've referenced elsewhere the observations of the songwriters and composers, David Arnold and Gary Clark, who during the first lockdown spoke about both songwriting and production as a part of a series of webinars hosted by the Ivers Academy. Their observ observations have resonated throughout this process, such as amazing records, not necessarily amazing songs. A good tune is a good tune. The first thing is to try and write a good tune. It's the production that's more likely to go out of date rather than the song. So how do you put things right? The first temptation is through the production process itself. In my case, usually starting with the harmonies. This can work and can lead to new ideas that may offer a fresh new feel. So we just have a quick blast of... Um, Excuse me if I don't stay, if I walk away for a little while Because the things I hear you say that make me want to cry Okay, the second temptation is to try and fix it by performing it better. But the dangers, for me at least, here lie in trying too hard and over-emoting. Sometimes you just have to go back to the song in its raw state and sing it with just the guitar to really pinpoint the issue. 
to look at the lyrics, which I discuss in more detail below. What, what was I trying to say? Did, did I really have something to say or anything that is worth saying? And am I saying it well enough? Toilets clean for the ladies in on their way. Using the tools creative instinct, innovation, and trust. That's all you can do. As Arnold again says, you have to trust your ears, writing, performance, and the recording of that. So in using those tools that are at our fingertips, interesting sounds can be inspiring and can give a fresh feel, a new energy. But, and it is a big but, a number of key points have emerged. Number one, interesting or clever doesn't mean good. Number two, you need to use what you've got. The latest plugin doesn't mean you're going to use them any more creatively or your ideas will be any more creative. It's how you use the tools that counts. And again, listening to so many webinars throughout um, this pandemic of so many artists on so many platforms talking about this production pro uh, their production processes, that's one of the key things that has come through again and again. For this reworking, I have used a lot of pads in conjunction with the guitars, pianos and voice. And this hasn't just been as a result of the lockdown where I couldn't pull in session players, but it has re resulted from a desire to remain faithful to the original approach to those early recordings. So I've been happy to a large extent to go with that if I can avoid any toe curling gaffes. So number four, the other key point that's emerged is that the process is also reinforced that an interesting perspective and energy can't actually replace the emotion of a played instrument. So what I'm going to do now is just share a few examples where I have used pads in this way. Um, in, in this case, the reworking of find it actually replaces what was the um, acoustic guitar. What I haven't done is play the original because I don't want to put you through that. Um, but this will, um, what is played by the pads what was just originally played by acoustic guitar. There you go. to the next one. This is a really very, very straightforward. The song was about joy riding um, and um, replacing what was done with the electric guitar here, done with very, very, again, simple effects to quite simply represent kids in a car.
in the third example here. Oh, stay. Staring at you. What like a fly, the fools, the kind, the shy, who will never shy. The lyric. I do write poetry in addition to lyrics, but they are different forms. As noted, in fact, by Bob Geldof, if anybody heard on Friday's Front Row, special edition uh, to commemorate the 80th birthday of Bob Dylan. That said, I do pay close attention to the musicality of language afforded not just by word choice, but by the positioning of the word in the line and the subsequent impact on meaning as well as on sound. More often than not though, a lot of my songs, particularly on the first album, are stories with characters drawn on from what I've seen. The key here then, again, akin to poetry is the right words in the right order, no more, no less to communicate the essence of those characters as, as I've perceived them, with close attention paid to the choice of words and their positioning within the line, which in turn suggests and supports the melody, which in turn aids that crucial phrasing in the subsequent performance, more of which below. So again, just two very short examples to illustrate. Leon had her head in her jumper when she said And won't come out for anyone Cross leg on the floor, the other children's dad she doesn't see, so she doesn't care Playing with her headband Chewing on her sleeve She's in a place nobody knows When she smiles her tiny friend Okay, okay, and very quickly, skinny <laughs> So unlocking the, unlocking the melody. So even if I've reworked and refined the lyrics, so that is competence, it's clear it works as such. The most important ingredient, if we can call it that, might still be missing. In fact, it's highly likely to be missing, having spent so long reworking the song, the it being the emotion. So how as a solo artist working on your own, do you trigger that essential emotional response that unlocks that melody or performance or both that you've been straining for? How do you manage to surprise yourself into a response that makes you feel compelled to sing? What helps for me in, in the guitar? I've recognized that simplifying the main line, i.e. releasing myself from the busyness of the acoustic guitar accompaniment that will have stemmed from the initial writing and then live performance of the song that required the band to, guitar to be the band, has allowed the songs to breathe and open up a space, a musical space, in which to write, play and position a guitar lead that has more often than not acted, either is the trigger to either hit on that elusive melody or if the melody and lyric really are okay, to perform it in a way that is faithful to the song's core theme, heart or intention. Apart from the harmonies, the guitar lines always come quickest, no matter what order I do them in, as they're closest to the voice. I've learned that I should try and do them pretty much following the initial guide track. 
as they are always almost the most faithful representation of the song. So again, just two tiny samples. So, in fact, I'm just going to give you one. So hitting the right note, the physical, the emotional, interpretation and tone. Performance, specifically regarding the vocal performance, is intricately and intimately connected and intertwined with the self-production process. Due to the need for objective judgment, i.e. to know when you've captured not necessarily the right take, but enough interpretations or approximations of what you're straining to express in the song, to then leave it and come back to it with fresh ears the next day, next week or month, however long it takes, to forget what you've done in the hope that you'll be surprised and not appalled when you listen again. Getting caught up in the emotion of your own performance can be very deceptive especially if you've been going at it too long and done too many takes. You can think you've done the performance of your life and then listen to it the next day and scrap the lot. In other words, knowing when you've tried too hard and missed the mark. Only fresh ears can tell you that. I'm very conscious of the dangers of over-emoting. And so in addition to avoiding multiple takes and overly long sessions, it is very important to create the right conditions to enable a well-judged, calm performance where the energy for the right performance is often effortless. Singing, quite simply, is physically and emotionally demanding and draining. Performance is physical as well as emotional, therefore physical well-being is essential. The voice is part and parcel of the body and needs to have all those things, food, good food, good exercise and good sleep to function. Knowing your own body patterns is therefore an essential part of the preparation to enable creativity to take place. Knowing what, when and how works best. Knowing your voice and how to use it. I've actually always taken the voice for granted and when I was younger too often went for the belting approach but it, and resulted in it often lacking nuance. This reworking has made me far more aware of it as an instrument, not least because of its extended range that has come with age and knowing how to use it within those ranges. The power of phrasing. I've also been alerted to the power of phrasing, the timing of the phrasing. So in addition to the observations of Arnold and Clark referenced above, the two renowned top liners speaking at the same series of Ivy's webinar made some equally valid comments. For example, top, top liner Lady V spoke of the ad advice she'd received on timing in her writing for top end commercial mainstream music on the importance of the melody line and vocal performance that slices through the beat. But perhaps what has resonate, resonated most has been the observation of Michelle Escoffery on the power of phrasing. Listening back, I've been able to hear lines being thrown away, either because the melody wasn't strong enough or what I was trying to say wasn't clear or interesting enough, or my ears weren't as alert as I'd spent too long in it and had become deaf to the bits that needed fixing. And so, When reading and discussing with students, most of whom are self-producing, as I'm sure is the case with some students here today, much of the existing ethnographic studies on music production, its processes and accompanying issues speak from the perspective of the producer engineer. 
having to get all these things right for the performing other, the musician. How much more so for the self-producer, particularly when each of these elements and aspects are so bound up with the compositional, or at least editing as composition. For instance, Sigorsky Thomas argues that the most important parameter in the way a musician engages in the performance is in what they hear. And that the way a performer judges their sound has emerged out of this way of hearing it, listening to your instrument being recorded through a microphone and played back to you through a pair of headphones alters that relationship. The methods and suggestions offered to stimulate intensive energy, excitement and energy when sessions are fragmented, repetitive and boring, reference scenarios to be overcome by a producer for the band or artist she's producing. These have to be replaced by the self-producer or the artist producer's alertness to staleness or studio deafness that derives from overworking rather than necessarily over familiarity, from getting sidetracked by technical problems, from trying too hard in the performance, which can result in not hearing why something is boring or whether the song isn't good, good enough or isn't right. So this stepping back before moving forward has in some ways been incredibly really important work because in revisiting and reworking, I've come full circle and arrived back at the song. This isn't in any way to deny the power of production, but it has served as an invaluable reminder that production is only at its most effective when the song is right. So to return to the poetry analogies, it is in the overall creative, performative and technical process in which the right parts are written and performed, then effectively recorded and subsequently and appropriately treated and positioned, wherein the Coleridge analogy can be applied most accurately. But this can only occur when all the other stages have been executed well. I'm not suggesting any kind of formula to follow, but simply that this reworking of some old tunes has highlighted a pattern of processes that I've observed through my own struggles, endeavors, strainings, and yearning for the right sound. In essence, production approaches don't change. All that changes are the choice of sounds or the tools to manipulate sound. For the self-producing artist, what is imperative is that judgment develops alongside the development of the songwriting or compositional skills. We've certainly moved from the moved come on a long way from the observation that music production is a different art form. And that if it is so, musicians should explore its technical possibilities that should embrace the creative potential of the edit in all its forms. We've also moved on from the view that as attitudes towards editing change, skill and experience in nonlinear performance, tailoring one's performance practices to the specifics of recording music has become a more valued second string to a musician's bow. And so too, the idea of production skills being merely a second string has long been disrupted. Judgment calls and decision-making in the studio are complex phenomena. The complexity of that phenomena is particularly marked for the self-producing artist. And that's it. So I've left it short and hopefully sweet. Um, to leave plenty of time for discussion. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. That's absolutely fascinating. I'm, um, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's super. 
How interesting to um, watch your thought processes as you return to songs that you wrote such a long time ago and that you're and to try and rethink what the emotion was at that time and how to bring that emotion out again with new process new practices and new technical skills so it's absolutely fascinating so thank you so much for laying that bare do we have any questions from our participants <laughs> Hi, Hussein. Sorry about that. I I kind of got. I, I I was just looking at them and thinking, no, it's the wrong one. No, it's that one. No, it's that one. Uh, Hi, Paula. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. Um, I mean, you 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 gave a guest lecture at the University uh, Westminster where I'm at uh, a That's couple right. of years ago at the launch yeah. of your book. Yeah. Uh, congratulations Thank for you. you know it belatedly so because I didn't see you that day, but you know, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I suppose I, I've I've kind of got two sort of. One is a kind of an observation, one is kind of a question. Yeah. So the first is an observation is the, I suppose the assertion of the, um, the performance of an instrument. Yeah. Uh, and, and whether that, and how, how one manages that in terms, of, um, in terms of ableism, like in terms of like how that might sort of lead into other kinds of, of discourses, especially if, you know, if Elon Musk gets to develop that brain neural interface and you can hook it up to MIDI and then you can just like think your way through a composition yeah, yeah. you know yeah. uh, so so I suppose I mean we, we you can argue I mean I, I use um, the Mimu gloves you know the oh yeah, yeah. so I use the Mimu gloves as well yeah and uh, a lot of the users well not a lot but a few are you know have 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 uh, motor neuron disease or things like that the musicians through their life cycles they've kind of got to a place where it's like they can't play the instrument of choice like guitar or whatever and then they've made they've availed themselves of these technologies to sort of yeah there was a there was a presentation on that wasn't there at the conference at, at uwl a couple of a couple of years ago yeah, they were talking yeah. about there was a great paper on that about yeah. those technologies yeah. yeah i mean i mean they're, they're, they're fantastic i mean i'm i'm sort of a believer in what, what whatever makes a noise <laughs> It's valid in my book, you know. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I was going to ask you about, which is where um, where the question is, yeah, is, is really about editing techniques because one of the things that you are saying, in many ways, you know, other other um, academics, let's say, I'm not going to use use it as a dirty word, but like other academics in that sort of field will say that things like editing techniques and so on are not a part of the authenticity of the performance whereas you're kind of advocating that actually you use the tools that are available to you to kind of hone it to the way that you want it to be much like you yeah. would do if you were working on the poet right that's right yeah so I, I was just wondering how you you know how you sort of negotiate these these two different kind of perspectives your own perspective on it where it's legitimate and then you have the others who sort of delegitimate it yeah, so I wonder well, what you feel about it. yeah. Well, those are the. I I think the the issues over editing are akin to the issues over production itself, aren't they? In terms of whether people interpret production as part of the compositional process, and where you draw those lines between production and composition, I think. I'm also almost tempted to say it's easier to draw the lines if there are lines to be drawn um, when you have an external producer. Um, sorry, mate. When you have an external producer uh, working on somebody's work, and then it's you know, and and an external mixing engineer. But I think in in the case of the the the, the artist producer, the self producing artist. They are, they they're inextricably bound, aren't they? They they really are. Sorry. Absolutely. No, I'm 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 in total agreement. I, I just keep myself off mic because I I'll throw you off 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 your yeah, thing. Yeah. But yes. But but, but, I, I, but, on, I, but no. But but it's. I suppose what I'm interested in is 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 digging into that process itself and looking at the ways in which 
not least because I, I, I hear this from students all the time, you know, and, and I hear their struggles with those with those editing processes and with the compositional processes. Um, so it, I suppose all I've tried try to do is separate them out in order to stand outside and then look at them, you know. Yeah. But but the lines are incredibly blurred, yeah. and and I think that blurring is a good thing. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. No, I I I, I mean. As someone who will use any technology available and instruments to kind of make a noise, it's fine by me. But the thing, but the problem is, is I suppose when literature becomes balanced towards one particular perspective and then makes yes. it feel like your perspective is going to have, it's going to struggle for kind of space and oxygen because it feels like it's it's overly consumed in this sort of authentic kind of product that must be, you know, the real statement of whatever, you know. But, and, but and, Sorry, go on. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> Please. No, 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 go on, finish, finish. Well, it, it's, it's, it, it also aligns with your statement about the creativity in Chiksen Mahali, you know, that, that, that there's a certain sort of use of um, these, this kind of research theoretical tools that kind of carves out a space that feels like a, a very difficult model to kind of conform with unless you are within that in that in that gang otherwise you're going to be like looking from the outside in to kind of you know the 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 impression that that i uh, received whenever i sort of read these sorts of materials so i was also interested when you when you mentioned the your response to like the ones who use chicks at mahali <laughs> as a justification for creativity yeah i the problem i have with that is that very notion of squeezing things into models and squeezing things into frameworks. Um, because, you know, if we talk of authenticity, I think nowhere is authenticity at question rather than constructing a framework for creativity and consciously stepping inside it to do your work, you know. Um, so I suppose I just tread very, very carefully. And I, I, I also tread carefully because a lot of that literature refers to, and a lot of those systems refer to collaborative creativity rather than solo creativity. Yeah. I, th I, 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 th and I, th it makes an easier fit if you're talking about collaboration rather than talking about solo creativity. But, but do you, you think that's because they want to veer away from the kind of the genius kind of? Model? Yeah, but that's a separate thing, you know. That that the 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 the, the, the Bourdieu interpretation is a very separate thing, I think, mm. um, and that applies. You know, the sociology of creativity applies to anybody, whether you're um, creating as a solo artist or within a band or whatever, because that that's the bigger picture, isn't it? But I suppose, again, what what I've been interested in in unearthing is the actual nitty gritty of what you have to do as a musician to trigger it, whether it be with technology or whether it be in a very, you know, simplistic retro way that I do, just going back to the guitar and the song and voice. It's yeah. whatever, ah. it's whatever triggers the, which is, would you say that even though you've just said anything that makes a sound, but would you say that you're interested in an emotional response from that sound that then triggers the desire to create something. Completely. It's, well, it's always about it. that. Yeah. It is all about that, isn't it? And For music, me it is, certainly. Yes, exactly. So One I suppose, of things, oh, sorry. sorry, go on. I was just going to say, so all, I suppose all I've tried to do, um, and it's something I've been very reticent, as I've said in the doing it into the past, to refer to my own stuff, um, is to just look at what I do to trigger to hopefully open up a quest, the, the conversation um, with students and whoever else about what are the triggers for other people. Yeah. Is it just technology or is it the actual sound? For me, it's the, it's the physical sound of the guitar 
and it's having it physically close to me that that does that trigger something in a way that yes there are lots of interesting pads on logic and whatever and yeah they're fun and they're great yeah but but they don't they don't get to you in the way that for me a guitar does but it could yeah. be that others would argue i was having this conversation with some thirges two weeks ago and one of the lads was saying exactly the opposite that it's actually the sound of a, of a pad or whatever it is some plug-in that it's like yeah i, I want to do something with this so yeah, yeah i'm interested in the triggers yeah. but i'm <laughs> equally interested in sorry i'm <laughs> interested in the necessary objectivity to recognize that they are triggers. Yeah. Are you with me? I, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I, yeah. the, the last observation I make, and I will, I will move off, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> yes, we've but, got but, more questions. But you, you and um, there's a there's a, a, a tendency in your and in, in some of the songs that you, you wrote that, that 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 use these movements of the tonic to the flat and seventh in terms mm. of like the chord positions and so on and the use of the seventh day, which reminds me of Suzanne Chiani because when she does her, 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 her music on the uh, prepared, vo prepared voltages that, that she, she uses a lot of the, the interval of uh, flat and seventh okay. and it, it sort of okay. brought that to mind. Thank you very okay. much. But Sorry thank you, Hussein. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. James, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, thank you. Um, hi, hello. everyone. Um, hi, Paula. Yeah, my name is James Reese, and I um, work at the Institute of Contemporary Music Performance in London. Oh, hi. Um, teaching, teaching creative music production. I was really interested in your process and hearing about that and um, kind of what you said about kind of solo creativity and, and how as a self-producer you're um, kind of doing all these roles yourself, you know, the composer, the recording engineer, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Um, so I was wondering um, at what part in, in your, kind of your process do you share your work um, and uh, yeah, do you, do you kind of do that at the end? Does that help to kind of give you the trust that you said you needed in your ears um, or can that be kind of um, hindrance to the process? I, <laughs> I'll only trust it. I mean, I'm terrified. I've never done this before, right? This is sharing in a way when nothing is mastered, it isn't finished. So anyway, so today has been a bit of an experiment. But the only people I would trust it to, and I'm sure everybody would say this, I'm sure your students would say the same, is one or two trusted people. One is usually my sister, uh, who knows nothing about music, but I trust her implicitly. But in terms of sharing it within the industry or publicly, not until it's mastered, not until right at the end where everything is completely finished. I would only trust it to family and friends. Are you different? Well, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm not necessarily different, but I'm wondering about how kind of uh, I encourage students to give feedback, like in the middle of that, uh, yeah, to get yeah, yeah, in yeah. the middle of that process. And I'm wondering yeah. like, is that, is that the kind of correct thing to do? Um, I don't know that there is a correct thing or not, but funnily enough, you know, I this, uh, I'm doing a particular module where they're doing exactly the same, where they're sharing with each other, and they have found it incredibly, incredibly useful um, to have shared their work and until they get to a, a, a finished stage. Um, and yes, you could argue there's a very, very strong argument that for a self-producing artist who doesn't have the benefit of fresh ears of a bloody producer sitting beside her, that or him, that it's invaluable to share, to get, to get that other, you know, to, to get the benefit of those fresh ears. But I suppose I've just developed over the years the need to just trust my own and not share them until the end um, or share them with the mastering engineer, you know. Great. So I don't know it being the right, I don't know that that's the right question, but I, I appreciate there is total value and I would probably, and of course, the other thing I think is, is generational as well, whereby I think younger people coming at self-production now, uh, certainly millennials, you know, young students who the idea of sharing everything isn't an issue. So therefore the idea of writing and it not being perfect, but then releasing it or sharing it straight away is no big deal. Uh, maybe just, I don't know, maybe 
as an older person doing it, I hold on to it for too long. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I tend to only share with uh, people I trust. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I think, in, yeah, we, in terms of students, it's I think it's probably our job as kind of teaching facilitators to kind of create a safe space for... Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's the main thing, isn't it? Um, and that's really important. That's really important. Yeah. Great. Can I ask a follow on question then about that? Use my chair's privilege. Um, because when you're talking about this, I'm thinking about my own creative practice and, and how I'm very unwilling to share things right up until the end but I'm wondering how you arrived at that decision that sharing things earlier was not going to be helpful for you um well one of the things I suppose what one th I'm coming at this at a roundabout way what 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 happens when you do share and I don't know if you found this and James I don't know if you found this but the moment you do share your work these fresh ears that I keep talking about, these precious things, sharing the minute you share to other people, the minute you've got somebody else in the room with you listening to that, well, what you've just done, your ears freshen immediately. You start to hear things that you hadn't noticed for the last six months. But the minute you've got somebody else and you're aware of what they're listening to, it freshens your perspective. So in many ways, that should be a good reason to share earlier but it's just that thing of it's it's I mean tell me tell me what is your reasoning for not sharing Rosie um so you've talked a bit about confidence that's that's a big thing and yeah. it taking a very long time to get to a point where I have that sense of confidence that I can listen to the sounds inside my head and work out how to create those outside my head taking a long time to get there and there's it's been a long um route through developing that sense of strength of strength of feeling I suppose that actually this is fucking good and I am going to do it my way that I confidence think. is is one of the core I mean I touched on it at the beginning but it is absolutely core um a woman, a self-producing woman who I wrote about um, a few years ago now, Juana Molina, she had a nice way of recognizing when, um, well, she had a wonderful way of firstly describing the self-production process, but secondly, a wonderful way of describing when she'd reached that point where she could share. Now, with regard to the first thing, um, we were talking about her decision not to work with the producer. And she had um, described music self-production as weaving a tapestry. So I'm very conscious of the gendered, you know, the, the sort of feminine metaphors here. But she had described it as, as weaving a tapestry. And every tiny thread, you know, just you, you takes time in, and you angst over it. But she was saying that for her to work with another, to work with a a, a Produce, music producer um, she said he or she would have to know me better than I know myself to be able to preempt what I would think or I would know better than me and she just she would and that, I suppose in some ways I would say the same that it'd be nice if that person existed but they don't that person doesn't exist the other thing that I touch on in the book, and I was going to talk about it today, but I didn't want to repeat myself, is, is that, you know, self-production is an art form. It is a separate art form to music production. It really is. For all those reasons that Wana was just saying. Um, what was the third thing? Oh, yeah. So in terms of when she knew it was ready, and I, feel, I come across this all the time, and I'm sure everybody who self-produces James and Hussein, I'm sure you all do the same. It's when you stop looking at the screen that you know you're ready to, you, you know it's almost ready. I.e. when you actually find yourself listening to it as opposed to hearing, oh shit, I've got to do that and that's not right and that's not right and uh, you know, when you're just listening to it, that's when it's ready. 
or either it's ready for the next stage, it's ready for mastering or it's ready whatever. Because once you've given it to the mastering engineer, and that's when I draw the line in terms of what I do, because I don't want to master, I have done everything. And then I want somebody who masters and does nothing else but that to, to master it. Um, but yeah, when I'm then listening to it, it's yeah, um, it's done, it's done. And she said the same thing. Well, she said oh. this, anyway, whatever, we both said the same thing. That's so, so I think interesting. that helps in terms of confidence. But, yeah. But I really like that idea of um, being known, needing to have a producer who is better, who knows you better than yourself. That's so interesting. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, Jan, time for one quick question before we have a little break. Yes. Yeah. Thank you again for this very insightful talk. And I would like to come back to one of the earliest uh, statements you did in your presentation. You started by describing your relationship between your practical work and your research. And yeah. um, as I mentioned before, this is part of our research seminar series for postgraduate students. Yes. And we have a couple of uh, postgraduate researchers here who also do practice-based research. So I was just wondering what made you change your mind um, and, and um, combine your, your two works more? And, and do you have any um, recommendations for, for starting practice-based researchers? Well, the first, uh, in answering the first question, uh, two reasons. Firstly, I was asked to do, um, I, to date, the majority of my guest lectures have been based on my normal, <laughs> normal research, gender and the book and, and all that stuff. But I was asked to do um, a, a guest lecture at Lippa uh, back in October, uh, um, September, about the actual production processes. So I, I deconstructed one of my songs and just went through it, you know, stage by stage. So that was the first thing. Uh, and then secondly, it was that lecture that um, when I gave, I gave, when Stan asked me to speak in November, it was two lectures. The first one was the normal one or the normal research rather on gender. But the second one was about this intersection. And, and I, which I was really shocked and surprised because nobody's ever asked me to talk about that in the past. And Stan said, well, a lot of our PhD students are struggling with this very thing, you know, with they want to somehow include their practice as part of their research. And I said, well, I've, I've never done that, you know. Um, but it got me what that lecture was then about wasn't, it was about both. It was about the process of production, as I've alluded to a little bit here, but the process of scholarship, because as I've said here, and as I said in the lecture, to me, they are exactly the same. And one of the things that I have said to students many, many times who are reticent, younger students, I have to say, about, um, you know, um, doing the reading, uh, uh, um, addressing scholarship when they just want to get into the studio, is that what I've said to them is that it may not feel as though reading scholarship and reading the theory is going to help you write better songs, but what it does is that it sharpens your eye and it sharpens your mind, which in a roundabout way may just also result in you writing better music. I don't know if that helps, <laughs> but... Um... Yes, I will definitely quote you on this. You have it on record. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Paula. Let's have no, another round of applause for Paula. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I think if we just take a five minute comfort break um, and then come back and we can continue the discussion.
Okay, welcome back. Hopefully most of you are already returned from from your break. Um, yeah, we um, have this, well, maybe uh, 15 minutes for like a wrapping this uh, wrap up discussion. And um, the intention was we have the opportunity to, to talk about something that might have come up um, while listening to the other presentations. Maybe you kept thinking about certain, um, yeah, certain previous discussions um, or there was something you hadn't had the opportunity to answer uh, to ask before so um, yeah if you have anything that you would like to ask uh, or to present us perhaps or make any general observations then this would be the right time Maybe I can make a start. Um, I would like to ask uh, Steve, we have recently chatted and we talked about the live music industry and um, in your presentation you just dropped uh, in passing pre-COVID uh, and probably you, you were indicating that something might change in the future, hopefully um, um, yeah, affected by, um, by, by necess or it could be a chance, um, the pandemic in a certain way to restructure the live music industry or the way um, live music could be run. So um, if we come back to the top topic of your talk, um, do you see any potential how all the innovations, so to speak, that happened in the last two years during the pandemic might break up um, the established structures in the industry and might um, reduce all the problems that you've talked about? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I've had trouble honestly, really wrapping my head around just what the last year and a half has meant for live music and its future. I mean, as I've maybe said to you, as I've certainly said to others who have talked about this with, like when I was doing my research, which, you know, I did worked on this book for over 10 years, um, it never occurred to me that we'd reach a point where live music was basically impossible to do. <laughs> so, having crossed that particular threshold it then becomes really hard to envision entirely what comes next um i have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of emphasis among the sort of dominant industry figures in really just returning as much as possible to business, what they would consider to be business as usual, right? They wanna reestablish their um, networks that they already had in place. And I, and, and in, an, in, in and of itself, that isn't gonna necessarily make for a more inclusive um, industry environment. You know, what I think, might matter more like i don't think covid per se is going to be a stimulus to much change in that particular regard i think in the us at least um all the struggles around the murder of george floyd and what came in the aftermath of that um and that is still very strongly resonating i mean you know we just had the trial around his case a few weeks ago um you know, that has definitely brought a level of public awareness to issues of racial disparity that has become really pronounced, you know, I mean, just US media institutions are talking about race in a way that they have never done in my lifetime. Um, how much will that spill into the concert industry, I think remains to be seen, because I do think there were some trends that we're moving in the right direction. Um, I didn't have a chance to mention this, but like I meant to say something at the end of my talk when I showed the slide about the 2019 data from Polestar that um, one thing that isn't shown on there, there are a lot of things that aren't shown on there, but you know, you don't see, for instance, what's happening in music festivals. And, you know, when Beyonce appeared at the Coachella Festival in 2018, that was a moment where I think there was a heightened awareness about how much festivals themselves were also not as inclusive as they should be. And I think in that realm, there has been efforts to redress the historical inequities. 
Um, I haven't seen those efforts be so clearly put into place with regard to the concert industry more generally. And, um, you know, the work of reprogramming, if you want to call it that, uh, like not just the like overt acts of racist exclusion, but the sort of hidden stuff. It's it's not something that happens in in a snap of a finger. Um, so I think it's going to take some time to convince the people who really have control over decision making that there is in fact a problem still, um, and then to figure out what the solutions are because. Um, I think there's always some room for people to create alternative institutions, but uh, like from what I know, for instance, you know, and this is very indicative of the fact that I live in a definitely a predominantly white area. Uh, but like the things that are alternatives where I live, like having house shows, right, very DIY, it's a very white scene. So I think you know, when you start thinking about like, well, how can you work around the dominant structures if you can't actually change them? Um, but that still requires a sort of privilege to be able to do, right? I mean, in order to have a house show, you have to have a house. <laughs> that in and of itself puts a pretty significant barrier of entry on like how easy it might be to actually produce something like that that's independently run that might be more inclusive, but is ultimately going to like cater to the audience of the people who are putting on those events. Um, so I, I would love to think that we come out of this with a real momentum about establishing some different ground rules for what's acceptable with regard to equity. I, I think it's going to still take a lot of work because I think the emphasis for the first several months after coming out of the lockdown when we're really, really moving more forward is just to kind of rebuild the stuff that was already there. Um, and I think a lot of people are gonna be afraid of they change too much too fast, they're not gonna be able to like, just recreate the things that they could rely on before. So interesting, Steve, to, to um, think about the structural problems within the live music industry, things that I'd never really been able to see before that had never occurred to me. Um, so I really found your um, talk really thought provoking. Um, I've been doing a bit of work on um, live music in the UK and the kinds of barriers that audiences face in attending gigs, but predominantly that work has been around sexual violence and like groping in the audience that kind of thing and starting to think about what that what other kinds of barriers exist um around um ableism and around racism but actually haven't considered the thought that it's a pretty significant barrier to go into a gig if your favorite artist can't play because they can't get a foothold in the in the live circuit right because mm -hmm. of some of those reasons that you've been talking about and i wonder if you know of any um, comparative research about the UK in that sense, I mean, I'm familiar with um, Simon Frith and colleagues' work, but don't know that they've addressed this particular issue. Not in a big way. The most recent, the last of the three volumes that they were working on just came out and I, mm. I have to read it. Uh, I'm actually supposed to review the whole three volumes at some point. So, um, you know, they do address in the last volume some stuff around um, race and performance a little bit. They get into some discussion of the grind scene, uh, but they don't really talk about it with regard to these issues of exclusion. Uh, it, it's not something that they get into very much. It's more like, you know, I think they're trying to have some balance in what they address. Mm. Um, they're covering I a lot of ground, aren't they? What's that? They're trying to cover a lot of ground. They cover a lot of ground, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I will say I, I haven't read uh, all, all that's out there, but the material that I have read around live music and other settings, um, I have not seen a ton of writing that has really specifically talked about the racial disparities in the live music industry. I, I, 
it's one of the reasons why I decided it was something I should really pay some attention to. Um, I mean, I've always had a, a concern with race as a part of a lot of the work that I've done over the years. Um, but in the context of live music, it seems like it just has such a material kind of significance that, um, you know, as I explain in one part of my book, a uh, different part where I'm talking about rock and roll, um, you know, segregation is basically about access to public space. And um, when you restrict that access, then you really are setting ground rules for who gets to rightly be in public and who doesn't, which is why, and, and, and in that connection, it then becomes really complicated to consider that live music events in the US are almost exclusively commercially based events. And as private commercial events, there are certain legal regulations about who can and cannot enter, but um, we also give commercial um, interests a lot of power over the kind of gateways to access of being in public in the first place. Um, I, I think there really is the need for more comparative research, especially maybe looking in settings where there's more public sponsorship you know, like state sponsorship of live music production and whether that makes a difference one way or the other. Um, so, so with the Nordic countries, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I do think is the case is that I do think a lot of state sponsored event production strives for a certain kind of inclusivity. Like you get folk festivals, for instance, where they try to have like, here's some of this ethnicity and here's some of this ethnicity and, you know, um, but A, one can question whether that's the best way to present diversity, if you want to call it that. Uh, and B, whether that effort to have diversity at the level of programming reflects itself in the diversity of audience and patronage is not clear to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I would certainly like to see more people doing that kind of research and for places outside of the US. Uh, I think it would be really helpful in a lot of ways. Because um, I think sometimes, you know, like Lena's anecdote with which she started her talk, like sometimes I think there's that kind of lack of translation that happens between talking about US race relations and talking about how these things play out in other parts of the world. I think there were some other issues going on there. I mean, yes, I not, think it's not, so yeah, it's not that we don't have a discourse of um, I'm not saying race blindness no here, but I think there's different vocabularies, right? Right, and so I think that um, having more research that looks into these things comparatively can also be a way to kind of check, like, what are the vocabularies we use to talk about these issues as well. Um, Hussein. You um, mentioned the Form 696, the Grime Report. Yeah, that, that was written by one of my colleagues, Michael Riley, uh, at the University of Westminster with um, Ticketmaster. I mean, it's oh, one of the times when the industry got behind it, because basically there was a Metropolitan Police form that from about 2006, it began to be realised that it was essentially just targeting Black events, you know, stuff like which would lead from dubstep into grime and so on, you know. Right. Um, one of the things that, that um, Steve was mentioning about state state kind of support. I mean, in the I, I, you know, I'm 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 old enough old enough yet young enough to have gone off to all of the GLC events as a as a as a young teenager at like Brockwell Park and things like that in London, uh, and all the Rock Against Racism and all of the two tone stuff and everything else like that. So the 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 role of in this in this instance, it, more than a kind of a national stratagem, it's much more of a of the local kind of uh, council or greater or greater council authority sort of uh, devising these things. But it's the sort of thing that with political change, um, you know, Margaret Thatcher, did, you know, gave everything the chop. Um, and, and, and so we, you know, the, these sorts of things sort of fall ever more below um, the, the, uh, the, 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 you know, in terms of accessibility, they become much more underground you need to kind of know people to kind of know that something's going on. Otherwise, you're just not going. 
Um, one of the things I would say that this country also had, which of course the states had as well, where they had, so in the states where you had the color line, in this country it was called the color bar. So black musicians couldn't play in certain places. Um, there's, a, there's an article by Jason Toynbee where he kind of documents this a little bit where um, one of the West Indian uh, musicians was kind of um, put out of work by one of the uh, musician union trombonists because he was playing in a band that he wasn't allowed to play in, you know. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that's from sort of the early 30s. And, and essentially, if, if, if you're in the country, but that already exists, and that's by the musicians union, right? So then as you carry on, as you, you, you end up de developing your own kind of sidelines, your own kind of under the radar things. Therefore, it looks like you're actually just getting on and doing stuff. Therefore, you don't really need to be included in the charts or be in this or be in that, because it looks like you're looking after yourself, that classic kind of neoliberal sense of empowerment that says that, well, you kind of found a solution for yourself. Well done. <laughs> we don't need to worry about you because you look after yourself. So we'll just carry on the way that we've always done business, you know. Um, so, it, 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 you know, the, these sorts of things, whilst the UK didn't, and, and didn't necessarily have the, a similar set of segregation and, 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 and uh, divisions. It still had those divisions and, and institutions that would over time become much more sympathetic, like the Musicians' Union, were not in the beginning, you know. So I just wanted to add that one in there. Anyway, it's lovely. I'm sorry, Rosie, that I'm, I take up so much time. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking of the um, Lovers Rock, the the movie, uh, okay. Steve McQueen. You know, yeah. I mean, that whole series has so much to say about these relationships that we're talking about. But Lovers Rock in particular actually makes me reflect on what I was just saying a few minutes ago about house shows, right? Because that's what that whole thing is. Uh, in, in that earlier manifestation, in terms of the late 50s and early 60s, the idea of house parties, blues parties, yeah. you know, um, yeah, but again, closed down by police and so on, because there was no access to a club-like infrastructure to hold a legitimate event. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, you, you're, you're quite right. I mean, I'm, I'm not far from Peckham, where Lovers, New Cross and, and Deptford, where Lovers Rock essentially started out, you know, and it, it's it, it's a it's a it's a fantastic, even though it's a bit sweet sometimes, but it's a fantastic kind of um, sort of take on reggae that 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 sort of fuses a lot of different sensibilities, both from the jazz classic songwriting in terms of Bacharach and David and various others, and then of course with with reggae rhythms, you know, how could it not go wrong, you know? It's fantastic. Please do, ECK Spencer, and if you want to introduce yourself as well. Hi, yes, I'm sorry that my username is um, just my initials. My name's um, Ed Spencer. Um, I'm a research fellow at Birmingham and a lecturer at Magdalen in um, Oxford. I was just thinking it's really interesting this sort of um, what Steve was saying about programming and about sort of comparisons between the US and elsewhere. Um, so my um, PhD research looks at um, US dubstep mm. um, and there's you know just in terms of looking at the sort of lineups of major festivals in places like Chicago um, and the big Lost Lands Festival in Ohio it's, it's just so um, white male dominated I mean 12th Planet who you know was a huge influence on Skrillex back in the sort of turn of 2010 2011 it's one of the few um, artists of color on the lineup and again increasingly there's this push to introduce sort of up and coming um, uh, female producers onto lineups and to have DJ sets and so on um, but it's, yeah, I mean, there's this really good special issue of dance cult um, about EDM and, and gender um, from, you know, a couple of years ago. And it's been very interesting to sort of 
read some of that work and look at this sort of situation in terms of lineups. And then, as you say, the, the contrast between, you know, trying to do something with the lineup versus the sort of demographic of participants. Um, and then on, online discourse as well, because there's still um, this gendering of the music um, as bro step and so on. Um, and then to, to kind of come back to what Hussein was also saying about the situation in the UK, on the other hand, you know, there, there's such a difference because dub, dubstep means something so different in a UK um, context and it's, you know, associated with, um, well, with, with, you know, as a sort of hybrid um, cultural form that isn't, you know, completely uh, sort of, um, that's much more sort of fluid, really. Um, mm. So yeah, I mean, it's just been a really fascinating um, day because I'm trying to sort of think about how to take this, this PhD work um, forward. Mm. And so, yeah, thank you so much for um, such an interesting day. And it's just my reflection. Really. Thank you. I would just say briefly, because I suspect we got to wrap up soon, but um, they, uh, I think in the US, from what I understand, this is an area like the, the place that um, electronic dance music occupies in the live music industry is actually one of the areas where things get very complicated with regard to thinking about race and programming because, um, you know, as a sort of parallel DJ driven music culture relative to hip hop. Um, I think in a sense, the live music industry almost like bypassed hip hop and then latched on to EDM as a sort of parallel move, but one that had a much more predominantly white uh, demographic associated with it. And so, you know, while you've got hip EDM festivals that are some of the biggest in the US at this point, some of the biggest in North America, uh, Electric Daisy Carnival maybe being the best known, um, there's nothing comparable in the way of hip hop. There's no hip hop festivals to speak of that are even remotely on the same scale. And I think there's a question as to whether on some level EDM is almost like substituted for hip hop in terms of being DJ beat driven music that has a mass audience, but that also promoters somehow feel is a safer thing to work with because of the demographics. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Because um, one of the things I sort of um, had to sort of try to untangle when I was writing um, the thesis was the distinction between EDM trap and um, trap rap. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that, you know, you often hear the voices of very prominent um, trap rappers, but there's again, this sort of strange way that this is this is very much not a hip hop festival as you say it's it's sort of um you know there's that very well known um collaboration between whack a flock of flame and diplo where he talks about trap going techno this is around sort of 2014 kind of time i think um yeah they're really you know there's a lot of stuff to be written about that phenomenon i think yeah <laughs> it's it's a really it's a really interesting one, but it's 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 tricky. It's really tricky to sort of um, try to you know. I think Justin Burson does quite a good job of trying to um, address that kind of phenomenon. Um, but yeah, there's there's more work to be done, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, Rupert. I it, it's interesting. It's quite. I don't know if it's just different in the UK, but I mean, there's also this thing that, that black music has gone from hip hop to rap to mainstream chart music. So at the, I was looking at the charts, did sort of thinking about this and, and out of the top 10, I think about in the UK, eight out of 10 acts are black. And, you know, I looked at a local arena uh, near me and you've got people like Stormzy performing uh, alongside JLS, you know, as, there's more than certainly more than twenty percent of the of the audience in the biggest arena in the area is is black, and it it's kind of commercial dance music is, is what we call urban music now has has taken over. 
so yeah, it's not in EDM, which is nowadays a pretty small subsection of the music industry. Um, so I think that that it it's complicated. I mean, it's not that I'm saying there isn't an issue that some sectors of the music industry are still very selective and exclusive. I think you're right about music festivals, for example. But then there are other areas where uh, where it, it's kind of the opposite. And I know there have been moves in America to to almost set up new charts that could be more could be less diverse almost you know they were almost setting up like a country chart or something not country chart I can't remember the name of the chart I saw a great paper about it in the US where they were where it's almost like the dance chart or the R&B chart or whatever they call it nowadays had just taken over the mainstream chart and there's been kind of kickback against that and I think it's 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 no better in the UK but it operates quite differently here than it does in the US and I, I guess in in Europe as well. Well, with booking, I would ask the question as to how localized that is. So like you just mentioned that um, venue that's like the kind of main venue in your region. Um, you know, are they owned by Live Nation? Are they booked more locally? Because that might offer some starting point for thinking about whether it's representative of a national trend or whether it's a more localized preference for booking in that region. Because I think that kind of stuff can vary a lot. I mean, that's, that's the big arena locally, and it'll be the same in every arena around around the country. Because you've got people like Rihanna performing, and Sia, and you know, um, Ariana Grande, and those sort of people who are monster stars. You know, they're some of the biggest stars we've got at the moment. For sure. Um, I mean, what I can say is, like, you know, I think it was in two thousand three that for the first time ever, the US uh, singles chart, the hot, two, hot 100 singles chart had all black artists in the top 10. But you saw nothing like that in the live music realm at all. There was like a complete disconnect and there still is. Um, you know, I mean, and in the UK, the one thing that comes to mind is, I think this was in 2007 or 2008 when Jay-Z played Glastonbury. And uh, I think it was Liam Gallagher or Noel, one of the Gallagher's was basically like, this is blasphemy. Like, how could we let someone, it was Noel, thank you. Um, how could we, how could we let this person in to this event? This is not the kind of stuff that Glastonbury is about. Um, so, you know, I, th I think the boundaries are definitely still there. And, and I think a lot of, like with that event in particular, it, a lot of what it came down to was um, how much rock specifically has been mobilized as a kind of racially exclusive terrain in a way that is so far removed from what it was when it began. Um, but I think in its latter day history, rock has become very whitened, which is what makes work like the kind of work that Lena does so important. Um, and uh, you know, while while work by people of color gets kind of pushed off into these other realms, but yet you still see like Beyonce, for instance, when she talks about the kind of star she wants to be, she still kind of uses the phrase rock star. It's kind of like what Murray was saying with my, in response to my presentation that, you know, Chuck D sees the Rolling Stones as like the kind of band he wants to model himself after because it's a certain kind of stardom a certain kind of career that rock kind of set the template for and that other artists see as like an aspiration, but the association with rock becomes a tool for gatekeeping to a certain degree. Um, so that while it may be the case that booking policies are getting to be a little bit more loose and representative, um, I think you still see those determinations being made more often than they should be. Um, I do still think there's room for a lot of variation, you know, like there's a lot more work to be done in terms of how to understand the relative homogenization of the concert industry that's happened through the influence of Live Nation and Ticketmaster on the one hand, but then where there are more squarely local alternatives um, that might reflect more local tastes and local demographics. 
and how booking policies might vary depending on whether they're primarily being determined by the sort of global interests or whether they're being determined by local promoters. I, I would like to see more work done on that particular score. Okay, I think I'll jump here and jump in here. Um, seems there's a lot of a lot to talk about still. So this calls for another round, another symposium in the future, hopefully. Just said in the in the chat, hopefully we'll do this more frequently, especially with everything we have now, the infrastructure, it's very, very easy. And um, we will, of course, upload this um, recording on YouTube so other people can have a look. Thank and you. yeah, um, thank you everybody for, for joining in, for your interest. Also, of course, to our presenters, Steve, Paula and Lena. And um, yeah, another round of applause. <laughs> A little group of us who are still here. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I think you have all deserved a break. And uh, we have lots of um, food for thought. And yeah, we, will look, we are looking forward to seeing you soon in Huddersfield locally or online. There will be another time. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for coming, everybody. Bye-bye. So much. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Rosie. This was great. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye Steve. Bye. Pleasure to meet you. Bye, 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 Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>